Boston, Maine, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Zealand, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Niagara, the Canadian side, Brussels, Zurich, Marseille, Brittany, Lisbon, Barcelona, Madrid, Munich, Prague, Athens, Budapest, Panama, Santo Domingo, Nassau, Mendoza, Sao Paulo, Niagara, the American side, Tokyo, Kyoto, Seoul, Kuala, Lumpur, Bangkok, Beijing, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Macau, Casino Niagara, The Fun Side, London, England, Great Britain, The United Kingdom, The UK. If they don't love it, they leave it. If you build it, they will come. And they will leave. Their mail folding is quite complicated. Architect, engineer, they are citizens of nowhere. He's standing in the customs line. Another endless red eye flight. make his connection he'll have to run he talks to the machine it says your papers please he smiles for the man with the gun international man nothing to declare citizen of nowhere He doesn't love, he leaves Fighting for what he believes No walls and no army Can change his course The system he resists Some say does not exist An architecture of force International man Nothing to declare Citizen of nowhere Citizen of nowhere He pledges allegiance to no one no candidate, country, or crest. You won't intimidate him with questions. He'll give you a name, but no mailing address. He's nowhere, citizen of nowhere. Nothing to Welcome to episode 007, Citizen of Nowhere, part 2. This is Joe, I'm an engineer living in Adelaide, South Australia. And this is Tim, I'm an architect traveling the world. In the last episode, I talked about how I've taken a year off from work to travel the world with my family. And we started exploring this concept of freedom of movement. 
We talked about some reasons why governments want to restrict movement into and out of their countries and discuss how they use the means of force to prohibit people from entering or exiting. In this episode, we want to expand that a bit and talk about what it means not just to get into a country, but to stay there for a longer period of time and become a citizen where you can enjoy all of the rights of everybody else within that country. Or in other words, the government stops prohibiting you from doing all of the normal things that everybody else gets to do in that country. Now, in episode four, Joe accused me of being a hypocrite for accepting money from the government for putting solar panels on my house. However, (laughs) Joe has sworn his allegiance to not one, but two separate governments. (laughs) The tables have turned. (laughs) So if you ask me, that's more hypocritical than me cashing in on a home improvement. (laughs) Yeah, so as I've mentioned before, I came out to Australia in 2008. But my experience with this sort of thing actually goes back a little bit further than that. So my wife was originally from Australia, and we met while working together when I was installing planetarium systems. The company that I was working for had an office in Melbourne, and she was working there for a while. And so she was able to come over to the U.S., on what's called an L-type visa, which is a bit different from, I think, the the typical visa that people get when they come to work in the U.S. I think it's called an H-1B or something like that. Uh Uh-huh. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think so. Or H, I don't know. If I was going to do a podcast with this or something, I would have researched this beforehand and I'd know. It's okay. I don't think anybody really cares. At any rate, this is a specific type of visa that allows a company to move someone from one of their offices in a foreign country into their office in the U.S., So I guess the idea there is that you're not actually displacing a job in the U.S. You're just bringing someone who you've already hired and who you're already paying to work from another office into the U.S. And so like most visas, I think she had to get this renewed every two years or something like that. But that wasn't too much of a big deal for us because the company managed that whole process and paid all the fees and everything. Mm -hmm. We eventually got married in early 2007. We actually flew over to Australia for the wedding and had the wedding over here, even though we weren't living over here permanently at that point. And after the wedding, we kind of had a honeymoon, except that my whole family and her whole family were with us, (laughs) traveling to wineries around Adelaide. (laughs) It was very romantic for all of us. (laughs) That's right. It was a lot of love in the air, (laughs) and a lot of wine in the glass. Not so much in the glass. And then shortly after that, I think I had a honeymoon in Korea, and she had a honeymoon in London or something like that. We both had to to go traveling for work after that, so we never kind of really had the the proper honeymoon, but I don't know, I guess one of of these days I'll make it up to her once the podcast hits it rich. (laughs) You guys should come to Puerto Rico. (laughs) And another funny thing about this wedding was that we actually had a second wedding reception back in the U.S. when we came back home about a month later. It was kind of funny because, you know, usually you get the wedding dress and the wedding suit and everything and you only wear it once, but we got to wear it twice. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It's two weddings, but it's basically two weddings for the price of two. (laughs) (laughs) Although at the second wedding, probably the most important thing we did there was a helium karaoke (laughs) where we had some helium balloons and then people could go up and try to sing karaoke. (laughs) I think the most successful song there was uh, a friend of ours who got up and sung some Aaron Neville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you haven't lived until you've heard somebody singing Aaron Neville's I Don't Know Much on Helium. <laughs> yeah, especially when it's a former football player. <laughs> Look at this man. <laughs> so now that we were married, technically my wife didn't need the work visa anymore. Because now we could get her a green card, which is essentially, at least in our case, it's essentially a spouse visa, which is a permanent resident visa, meaning that she can live indefinitely in the U.S., basically as long as she's still married to me. Oh, so that's how you roped her in. (laughs) (laughs) So you guys were married, and now she wants to live in the United States with her husband. So I would assume that's a pretty straightforward process, right? No, believe it or not, it's actually a, a pretty lengthy and arduous process. You don't say. First of all, just figuring out all the information that you have to pull together in order to submit your application for this thing, let alone figure out which forms you need to submit and what supporting documentation you need for each of those forms is a project unto itself. It probably took us, I don't know, three months or something like that just to to pull all this stuff together and get this all figured out. And before I get into all the details here, I mean, bear in mind, it took us this long to work it out. You know, we're both English-speaking professionals who have a pretty good understanding of how to find our way through paperwork and legal documents and that sort of thing. I really feel for someone who's going through this process who isn't quite as 
sophisticated in their knowledge as we are. You mean like they don't understand words like whilst? <laughs> and who might not even speak the language. I mean, I guess they probably do have these forms in different languages. I think a lot of people essentially just hire an attorney who specializes in this kind of thing to manage their whole process. Yeah, but even still, there's all kinds of, just all the documentation that you need to be able to pull together to make this happen. To be honest, I don't remember the whole process, but there's probably 10 or 20 different ways that you can pull together various types of documentation in order to submit your application. Right, unless you're coming from some war-torn country that has no record of your birth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We'll, we'll get to that a little later. I want to give you a feel for some of the information that you have to pull together for this thing. You have to have your residential history for the past five years, meaning your addresses and start and end dates that you are at that address, as well as your past five years employment, the company details, and the dates that you were there. And then the person who's sponsoring you, which is in my case is me as the existing American citizen. And so the sponsor has to provide the past three years tax returns. Now, luckily, I'm a bit of a bureaucrat at heart, so I tend to keep pretty good records of things. <laughs> so we were able to dig up most of this stuff. Boy, I, I hope I don't have to do that in the next few years. Yeah, well, more on that later. <laughs> so there's a couple of forms you have to fill out. One is called the I-485 form. And this is essentially the form that the person who's applying has to fill out with all their personal details, including stuff like, you know, their parents' names, birth dates, city of birth, all this stuff. I mean, I actually learned a lot about my family and my wife's family through this process, learning where everyone's born, you know, maiden names of grandparents and all this stuff. <laughs> right. And then at the end of the document, there's basically a survey which has something like, I don't know, 20, 25 questions. I'll just read off a couple of them here because there's a few that are kind of interesting. Well, first of all, you have to list your present and past membership in or affiliation with every organization, association, fund, foundation, party, club, society, or similar group in the United States or in other places since your 16th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so every club that you join in high school, you know, for arts club or film club or some, or whatever, you know, you've got to put that down, <laughs> presumably. I mean, I don't know how, how thoroughly they audit this stuff. You have to admit to being a band geek in high school. I was in a rock band in high school. Does that count as a club or a, a party or something? That was more of a movement. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So this is the sort of stuff that you probably haven't documented. Probably what we did was just came up with a few of the ones that we could remember, put them down, at least to make a show of it, you know, that we, <laughs> we put some effort into it, you know. <laughs> right. And then you get to the interview and they start grilling you. Did you play Ultimate Frisbee in college? Why did you put that on the forum? <laughs> yeah, that's right. We know you were in a book club. <laughs> what did you read? <laughs> was it an Oprah book club? Was it an Oprah book club? Did you read Life of Pi? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> Should I read it? <laughs> My wife said it was really good. If you make it through that ordeal, and of course, the nice thing is they do say that if additional space is needed, you can use a separate piece of paper. They offer you that kindness. Uh -huh. But so some of these other ones are great. You know, there's one, of course, have you ever knowingly committed any crime of moral turpitude or a drug-related offense for which you have not been arrested? The hell is moral turpitude? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I guess you'd find out. This is where, you know, everything you never got caught for, it's time to spill the beans. <laughs> <laughs> right. You, know, <'cause laughs> you have to tell them, like, how many times you masturbated or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm afraid to look up the definition of moral turpitude. <laughs> And this one fits in really well with the theme of this episode, which is, do you intend to engage in the United States in espionage? Have you ever been affiliated with a communist or other totalitarian party? What, so they're asking if you're a Democrat or a Republican? Yeah, something like that. I, I, we just ticked yes. Now, one of the questions that I often ask people who I invite to my house is, have you ever engaged in genocide? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell them about that time in college, did you? You know, what happens in Niagara stays in Niagara. <laughs> <laughs> the other question that I often ask people shortly before I invite them to my house is, do you plan to practice polygamy in the U.S.? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you plan to practice polygamy. I think it just happens. <laughs> it just feels right. <laughs> 
those are just a few. And again, there's something like 20 or 25 of those things. I've just picked out some of the best ones. So what happens if you answer yes to one of these things? I don't they know. They just deny you the, uh, I mean, I guess all this stuff is just building up to some process where they can deny your wife the ability to reside with you in the United States. Is that right? When you're filling it out, that's certainly the feeling you get is like, well, gee, I hope I don't have to answer yes to any of these. Well, who would? I mean, it's obvious where it's going. Right, right. I mean, oh, like, oh yeah. crap, they got me. I did engage in genocide. I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew that was going to come back to bite me. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't gotten caught for engaging in genocide by the time you're on your way to the United States, you're probably not going to get caught for it. Well, another question that's related to that, which I didn't mention, is they specifically ask if you were a member of the Nazi Party in Germany from 1933 to 1944. And if you worked in concentration camps or something like that, it's, it's like very specific. <laughs> yeah, it's okay if you were part of the party as long as you weren't in the camps, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean the other guys were all right. They weren't causing too much trouble. Just following orders. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the funny thing is, is that this is like, you know, 2008. I mean, how many people who would have been doing that would still be alive at this? I guess some of them might be in their like 90s or close to their deathbeds. Again, it's the sort of thing like you figure that they probably would have been found out by now. It's not like they're going to have a sudden pang of conscience and come forward to the U.S. government you know, <laughs> as they're begging to be allowed to live permanently in the country. Right. <laughs> so that's basically the form that the applicant has to fill out. And then there's another form called the I-864 form, which the sponsor has to fill out. And the main purpose of this is to essentially make the sponsor accountable for this person who they're bringing into the country. In the last episode, we talked a little bit about how there are concerns about people who could come to the country and not have the means to support themselves. And so this whole form is essentially making sure that there's someone there who does have the means to support the person who's coming in. And so as a sponsor, I had to demonstrate that I could support my wife at a certain level above the poverty line. And so this is where I had to provide my previous tax returns to show that I had a stable income. And I guess probably also that I was a good taxpayer. <laughs> and so one of the main outcomes of this process is that once my wife got her green card, then all of my income and assets would be made available to her. Yeah, that happened to me too when I got married, but I didn't have to fill out any forms. So that's the bulk of the paperwork. I was confused when I did it because there was some other forms that are like, it's just another kind of form proving your identities and your history and all that stuff, which we got all the information and populated these forms. And then I think in the end, we didn't even need them. So, hmm. so again, like I said, it's a confusing process. So once we had had all the forms filled out, then there was a few other things we had to do. One was that my wife had to go to a doctor and get, I think there was a tuberculosis test and basically a general kind of checkup physical the interesting thing about this was there, there's only certain doctors that you can go to who are registered to do this. The waiting room was basically just full of people who are clearly immigrants <laughs> who are all basically there for the same reason as we were <laughs> just to get this one checkup. So you look at that and it seems like a racket that, you know, this doctor's hit on something pretty good. So these are people who have already been allowed into the country and then they're going to the doctor to find out if they have tuberculosis. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. I think they kind of missed the boat by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I can't remember what other diseases they might have checked for, but you know, I'm guessing that there are other communicable diseases <laughs> that aren't on the test. Well, if you didn't have it already, that waiting room is probably one of the best places to get tuberculosis. <laughs> Another process we had to do was a police check, where she had to go down and get her fingerprints taken, and they do the whole background check and history to make sure that you know she hasn't got any outstanding parking tickets in Canada or wherever else. <laughs> make sure she's not wanted by Interpol or something like that. Once we had gotten all that stuff done, then we had to submit our application and wait for confirmation of an interview. And of course, with all these processes, you know it's like you submit this thing and then you wait something like three weeks even to get notified that you've got an interview. And then it's like another three or four weeks before you even get the interview. So what would happen if she didn't have the original work visa to be allowed in the country to begin with? I mean, if people are just getting married and then coming to the country to start going through this process, what happens? Do you just get kicked out before they ever get their interview, before they finish the process? There's some sort of, I think they call it like a fiancé visa or something like that that you can get, uh -huh. which does allow you to stay in the country sort of up until you get your green card or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's this whole other process that you have to go through. So for us, it didn't really matter because she had the other visa. Okay. And I do know a few people who have gone through this process as well. They haven't been as lucky as us where they've been in the country on a basically a tourist visa 
And under that visa, they only get 90 days in the country and then they have to leave. And I think you can like leave, you know, go to Canada for a weekend and then come back in for another 90 days Hmm. or something like that. But then after that, you've got to leave for, I forget what it is, three months or six months or something like that before you Hmm. can apply for another one. Yeah. So it's really inconvenient for those people, especially if you're waiting for this process. Again, I don't know whether you have to leave the country or anything like that, but I imagine that, I mean, it was a stressful time for us because you're just kind of in limbo. And you don't know when things are going to happen or if you've filled out the forms all correctly or if you've missed some other detail somewhere that's going to cause a problem down the road. For us, it was stressful. And I can imagine for someone who doesn't have that other visa to rely on that that it can be a pretty trying experience, especially that early on in your marriage. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not like you're just trying to get this person to the U.S. If for some reason that process doesn't go through and they're not allowed in. Then you have to try to get the other spouse back into their country, wherever they're allowed to be. Right. (laughs) So it's not like there's just some default where you could be together somewhere in some country. There's a possibility that the two of you might never be allowed to be together in any country. That's right. And not to mention, again, some of these other people I know have been put in a position where they're essentially forced to marry each other just to stay together because of these problems, because they've only got... 90 days in the country or or 180 days or whatever it is. And then when that time's up, they've basically got to make a decision. I had one friend whose wife was German and she was over here in the U.S. And we were all kind of wondering how she had managed to stay in the U.S. for so long just on a tourist visa. (laughs) Right. But of course, they revealed to us about a year later that they had actually gotten married just as the time was running out. They had gone to a justice of the peace and tied the knot. Right. And it worked out for them. But of course, it's a it's a really stressful situation, you know, for, for any relationship. It's a huge decision to make. And when you've got that kind of pressure on you for this arbitrary reason, because there's some guys with forms who have a lot of friends who have guns, who have come up with a number out of thin air as to the proper amount of days that a person should be allowed to stay in a country. Right. I just don't think that can be justified in any way. Yeah, but I'm sure that they don't feel any moral turpitude over that. And so this stress and these challenges on your marriage culminate in your interview. Now, when we had our interview, it was in some, I don't remember exactly where it was. It was, it was basically just an office in a strip mall somewhere <laughs> that was like the U.S. Citizen Services or whatever it's called. You walk in and there's like a hairdresser next door and a laundromat on the other side. And there's just like, you know, U.S. Citizen <laughs> Services right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. You walk in there and it's like, you've got to go through a metal detector. There's a TSA guard kind of guy standing there, the security guard. You know, you've got to put all your, take your shoes off, put all your stuff in the tray. And of course, it's funny, you know, because I can't remember the last time I walked into any private institution and had to go through this kind of rigmarole just to walk into the door. It's almost as if people have a reason to be pissed off at governments, that they don't have a reason to be pissed off at other organizations. <laughs> what that could be. <laughs> well, and the reality is, and we're getting off topic a bit here, but there are private organizations that can be threatened by people coming in the door. I mean, certainly banks and even some hospitals that I've worked with, they have concerns about trying to keep the people in their building secure from everybody who walks in the door. But it's very rare to find something like a metal detector and an armed guard standing at the door to a hospital or even to a bank. But maybe not a public school. Because by and large in private society, people have faith in one another that they're not going to initiate force. But for government facilities, there's this presumption that anybody coming in the door could pose an imminent threat. And it's the same mentality that they have towards everybody coming into the country, is that everybody is a potential criminal until proven otherwise. Right. And part of this, too, is you walk in there and you immediately confronted with the security guard, and it kind of puts you on the back foot where you're intimidated right off the bat. You're already a bit nervous going into this thing because you don't know, you don't really know what questions you're going to get asked or whatever, and there's quite a lot riding on it as well. We get called in for our interview, and it's just in a small office with a lady behind a computer. And, you know, it just looks like any other office you'd find anywhere else. And so she pulls out our application and starts going through it and and starts asking us questions. I can't remember exactly how it went, but I think she probably went through some of the questions, you know, like, are you a Nazi? Have you committed genocide? Have you committed a moral turpitude? (laughs) (laughs) All the important things that she needs to ask probably just to see what your answers are face to face. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't remember if she tried to trip us up on any of that stuff at all. Then they started getting into essentially proving that your marriage is legitimate and that you haven't just done it in order to get a green card for someone. (laughs) Right. 
So there's an Australian movie called Muriel's Wedding, which is sort of like a classic 80s Australian comedy where where this goofy girl ends up getting married to this South African Olympic swimmer so that he can get onto the Australian Olympic team to swim <laughs> in the Olympics. <laughs> but the whole thing's a sham. And so this is the sort of thing that they're, they're trying to prevent. <laughs> so what do they do? They make you like consummate your marriage right there in the office? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we thought about it. <laughs> I know, I forgot. They're the ones trying to screw you in this process. <laughs> they start asking questions, and you get to a point where it's like, well, what do you, what do you want us to do? Like, start kissing each other or something? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? How can you prove to this person that you love your wife? It's not like you could just walk into this office holding a boombox over your head playing Peter Gabriel. That would have gotten picked up at the metal detector. <laughs> So I mean, we're pulling out photos of our wedding and stuff. We're like, oh, look, you know, we had a real wedding in Australia and we had another one in America. You know, that's how much we love each other. We had two weddings. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and she actually said, she's like, oh, well, you could have just Photoshopped those. Or like, you could have <laughs> staged that or whatever. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> right. That's an expensive staging. <laughs> yeah. I mean, give me a break. But one, th- one thing that did help was the fact that we had commingled finances, which essentially meant that we had a bank account that was in both of our name. And we had had that for, I don't know, a year or six months or something like that, you know, prior to this whole application process. So that's one thing that at least you can kind of show that, look, we've already got this, you know, when you talk about your financial commitment to this person, if you've already kind of mixed your bank accounts together, that's a good piece of evidence that you can provide. I don't remember exactly how we did it, but somehow we won her over. Did she give you like a little heart sticker when you left that you could put on your shirt? No, she branded us like cattle. <laughs> And after that, she lightened up a little bit and we got to a point where we, where there was a few more, you know, of course there was more forms that we had to fill in on her computer or whatever. And as she was putting in some more information into her computer, there was one part that we got hung up on regarding a country code, which is kind of funny that even this person who does this every day couldn't really figure out the process here. But so finally we got through that picked up our boom box on the way out <laughs> and then came the process of just waiting two months or whatever it takes for the actual green card to be issued. And so again, you're in this sort of limbo position where you're just waiting and waiting and not exactly sure when this thing's going to happen. I think it was October of 2007 that we finally got the card. And so it had taken us about six months for this whole process, as well as all the fees, which I haven't mentioned yet, which were once you factor in all the police checks and the doctor fees and all this stuff, I, I think it ended up costing us somewhere around 1800 bucks for the yeah. whole process. Huh. So it's not cheap. I mean, again, if someone's coming into the country, if they're not of means, then they'll struggle just to pay the fees for this process. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is just a couple months later, my wife was offered a job back here in Adelaide, South Australia. So we had literally gotten this green card. And then three months later, I don't think her other visa had even expired yet. <laughs> <laughs> and she, we had decided to move back to Australia. <laughs> so we hired some movers. We didn't have much to ship over because all of our stuff was just Ikea anyways. And, and the nice thing about I, having Ikea stuff is wherever you go, there's an Ikea there. You can just buy the same stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically what we did. Rather than shipping it over, we just bought new stuff, all the same stuff we had had. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the icing on the cake to all this it wasn't even that my wife didn't really need the green card anymore. I mean, it would have been nice to have because we did plan on traveling back periodically to visit the family and everything. But once you've left the country, you actually have to relinquish your green card and give it back. <laughs> so we went through this whole process just to have a green card for like three months. When you didn't need it. <laughs> when we didn't even need it. And then we had to give it up once we got over here to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> So what would happen if you decided to move back? Would you have to go through that whole process all over again? What they've told us over the phone when they were telling us that we had to relinquish the card was that, oh, well, yeah, but it should be easier the second time around because you're already in the system or something like that. Yeah, but, sure. I mean, actually, when we had gotten our green card, and I think the lady interviewing us had told us that you know, because we had had all the paperwork and all the documentation and everything that we needed – that there was some way that she could put us on some sort of a fast track or something like that. You know, <laughs> yeah. The fast track means it only took two months to get the green card after the interview. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to, I don't know how long it would take for if you were on the slow track. Oh, right. But yeah, supposedly would be on a similar sort of fast track the next time around if we moved back. What was the process like moving from the U.S. to Australia? I know you said you had to buy all new IKEA furniture, but you must have had some stuff that you brought with you. Yeah, like I said, we hired some movers, and the way it works is that we booked a quarter of a shipping container 
and we could put whatever we wanted into that space. That was the smallest space that we could book for an international shipment. So this is the first time in my life that I had actually hired movers. Now, Tim and I had actually worked throughout high school as a summer job as furniture movers. So, <laughs> so I figured that I had had my fill of that for my life. So I was happy to finally hire someone else to do it for me. Hopefully they treated your stuff better than we treated everybody else's stuff. <laughs> well, I made sure I tipped them to, to help out with that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tip before or after? <laughs> I think I, I might have offered them some lunch or something while they were doing it. So, And by the way, it is customary to tip movers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when you think about it, you'll tip someone 15% of the bill to bring your food from the kitchen to your table. But you won't tip someone 10 bucks to move everything you own to the other side of the world. <laughs> right, and they accept payment in beer as well. Denominated in six packs. <laughs> <laughs> so even though these guys did a lot of the packing, we still did a lot of the packing ourselves for anything that wasn't breakable. And the nice thing was that I rang up my old boss originally to see if he could move us, but it turned out that he didn't do international moves. But he did offer to uh, provide me with some free boxes, so... That was a nice win. I guess that made all those summers of backbreaking labor worth it. Huh? <laughs> Paid off in the end. A quarter of a container isn't that much, so we didn't really have any big furniture or anything in there. We had just some stuff that was difficult to replace once we got to Australia. For example, I had some guitars and keyboards, you know, musical equipment. And it seemed to me like we had an inordinate amount of books and photos in picture frames. <laughs> As I was packing all this stuff, I'm thinking, you know, why don't we just take these things out of the frames, put them in an envelope, put it in a carry-on bag, <laughs> and then just buy some new frames once we get to Australia. <laughs> or just reprint the pictures when you get to yeah. Australia. <laughs> I mean, we've got, they're all digital anyway. So, I mean, some of them are old or whatever. Because <laughs> then what are you going to do with all the old picture frames? You know, you're just going to chuck them out or whatever. Smash them. And now we didn't really bring over any electronics or anything because, of course, the voltages are different. In the U.S., everything's 110. In Australia, it's 240 volts. Right. <laughs> Working in planetariums, I've cooked my fair share of DVD players. <laughs> <laughs> you plug it in, it just goes, bzzz, pop. <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> well, plus, it, like the DVDs and stuff don't work in different countries anyways, right? Yeah, I mean, these days you can get pretty much every DVD player will play the different regions or whatever. But it was, it was a nice excuse to buy all new stuff once we got out here. <laughs> The nice thing was that the condo that we were living in, which, is, which we owned, we decided to keep it and we were renting it out to my sister, I actually agreed to move in after I left. Mm -hmm. And this is the same sister that I think in the previous episode we said was collecting Tim's mail. So mm -hmm. <laughs> without her, we'd both be stuck in the States, I guess. <laughs> yeah. None of this would ever have happened. So we left a lot of the furniture and TVs and stuff like that there and, and they were happy to take it. A couple other things I decided to bring to Australia. One was a bike, which I had just recently purchased, and I think I had only ridden it once <laughs> since I bought it. So I, I wanted to bring that along. And another one was my skis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if you've ever seen a map of Australia, <laughs> but there's not a lot of skiing in Australia. There are actually some mountains in the east, maybe four hours drive from Melbourne. Uh -huh. But to this date, these skis have just been sitting in my shed collecting dust. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So have mine. <laughs> but it was the same kind of thing where this brand new pair of skis that I had only used once. And so, <laughs> so I felt like, well, I got to do something with them. <laughs> Plus, you probably couldn't ride the bike either because it was on the wrong side of the road, right? Yeah, I had to switch the pedals around the other way. Yeah. Well, and, and then the other thing is when you get to Australia, I mean, everything's just upside down. You know, so that makes it hard. <laughs> So did you have to do some kind of paperwork or something to get that shipping container into the country? The moving company handled a lot of that. And I was actually surprised at how cheap it was given the amount of service that they were giving us. I think it only cost us something like three or 4,000 bucks for including these guys' time coming to our house and on the other end, the guys delivering it. Really? Yeah. Huh. These days to ship something from, say, the US or Europe to Australia is somewhere on the order of maybe 10,000 bucks for a whole container. Hmm. They would have obviously packed our stuff in with someone else's stuff. Right. And that's the benefit of these logistics companies is that they can take a bunch of different shipments from all different places, pack them together, and then unpack them on the other side and distribute them to where they need to go. Oh, so you didn't do this through the U.S. mail? <laughs> or Oz Post. <laughs> It would still be waiting. <laughs> we did have to fill out a customs declaration form, and that wasn't really too difficult. I think the one thing that... I got a little hung up on was they ask if you have any wooden products or something like that. I can't remember. We probably did have, you know, some picture frames that were wooden or we might have had one or two small pieces of furniture or something like that. 
you just had to list some stuff that you had. You probably had to list the values of some of the stuff. Usually with the customs form, you have to list what's in the shipment and some sort of total value of everything that's being shipped. And again, I imagine if you're if you're doing a shipping container full of dried fish, you might have to declare that. <laughs> <laughs> but we finished off all our dried fish before we left. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You didn't leave it for a sister? <laughs> we left a little bit for the sister. Just hidden around the, the apartment for them to find? <laughs> like an Easter egg hunt? Uh, under the bed. Just left some floating around in the bathtub. <laughs> so this stuff took something like three months to get to Australia, which ended up working all right because I think the way it worked out, the day that the stuff arrived was two days after we had closed on the house that we bought once we moved out here. <laughs> so it actually worked out perfectly that instead of having to do some sort of local storage, they could just deliver it direct to the house. And we had everything ready to go as soon as we got here. So how long did that take to ship it out? It took about two months and it was kind of cool because you could, in our invoice from the moving company, they told you which ship the container was on. There's websites you can get online and track different ships that are traveling around the ocean. So we could actually see this thing on its way from LA to, I think it was stopped at Singapore or something, and then down to Australia. And before we came out, in addition to packing up all our stuff, it was kind of like Tim's process trying to leave the house before his trip, where we were trying to finish off all these projects we had started. We had done some painting on the walls. We had to finish up all those new light switch covers, a couple of new structural light switch covers. <laughs> and the way it worked out is that both my wife and I were working on a project in New Zealand in November, December of 2007. And we ended up just going to Australia for Christmas that year. So at that point, she had put in her leave and everything, and she was finishing up at the end of the year. So she stayed in Australia from there, and then I came back to the U.S. to finish up some of the stuff at the house, as well as I, was, I still had some other projects I was working on at work within the U.S. So I didn't get back out here until something like the end of February, I think, February or March. Once you got to Australia, did you then have to go through the same kind of visa and green card process that you went through in the United States? Yeah, it's a very similar process to what we did with the green card in the U.S. In Australia, I find that things tend to be just a little bit more difficult than they are in the U.S., a little bit more bureaucratic. For example, where my wife only had to put down her past residences for the past five years, I had to do it for the past 10 years. And what was much worse, which we didn't really have to do with my wife's green card, was that I had to list all of my prior international travel. <laughs> and this is after I had spent six years traveling the world, installing these planetarium systems. Yeah. <laughs> In that time, I had filled up a complete passport <laughs> with stamps and, you know, and had to get a new one, not because my passport expired, but because the old one was too full. Uh -huh. And so this is a big project just to figure out where the hell I had been for the last five or six years. Yeah. <laughs> So this is where I think in the last episode we talked about going through and looking at all my passport stamps and the dates of entry and exit from each country. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is where that came in handy that I actually had to figure this all out. <laughs> it took me days. It was probably, you know, I was going through the passport and then because some countries don't stamp, I'm going through flight itineraries. I'm going through my old expense reports. Uh -huh. now, luckily I had those. <laughs> that was probably the best resource I had. Yeah. On what days was I on a plane or at an airport or something like that. Mm -hmm. And luckily I had kept a lot of this stuff in a, a database that I used to do all my expense reports in. Now, I don't think I had to do a doctor's visit like my wife did, but I did have to do a police check. With this visa also, I don't think I had to do another interview the way that we did in the US. So in that sense, it was a bit easier. It was basically just populate and mail in the form and then wait three months or whatever it was for the visa to be issued. Mm -hmm. One thing that they asked for was my original birth certificate which I was supposed to submit with the visa application. Now, of course, in the U.S., the way they do it is they store the originals at the local town hall, and you can go in and get a copy, I think maybe a notarized copy or something like that, but you can't actually take the original out of the town hall, from my understanding. So, of course, it was <laughs> going to be impossible for me to mail this original to the Australian government to get this visa. It turned out that I ended up having my parents go down there and get a copy of it and mail it to me, and then I submitted a, a notarized copy of it. And it turned out that that was okay, and they accepted that. But in general, it's just a good idea for any sort of important documentation like that. Go and get a few notarized copies just to have in your possession, so that if you ever need them for something like this, you've got a few that you can send around without having to go through the whole process. Yeah. We've done that with our birth certificates, marriage certificates, kids' birth certificates, all that kind of stuff. Anything that might yeah. have to be kind of notarized copy, then 
it's good to have a few of those on hand. When you get up and flee the country, you don't have that stuff <laughs> That's on That's right. <laughs> Probably the more confusing part of this process was the actual issuing of the visa. Now, one thing that they said on all the applications was that I actually had to be in the country of Australia on the day that they issued the visa for some reason. <laughs> I don't understand the reasoning behind this, but for whatever reason, that's a requirement on the thing. And again, I was still traveling quite a bit with work at the time. So what it meant is that I was supposed to ring them up every time I went on a trip somewhere, every time I left the country, uh -huh. I was supposed to ring them and let them know, you know that I was going to be out of the country for the next two weeks or whatever it's going to be, <laughs> and not to issue the visa within those two weeks. Uh -huh. And of course, it's a very one-sided process where I'm giving them all this information about where I'm going, but I'm not getting any information back about when I can actually expect this thing to be issued. Right. <laughs> it's not like you can plan around it or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so it eventually was issued. And I think I just got a letter in the mail or something. Now in Australia, the way this visa worked was that it was provisional for two years and then became permanent. And what that means is that within the first two years, if my wife and I got divorced, then I would lose my visa. <laughs> it's essentially another protection against some sort of fraudulent marriage scam where you could fake your marriage just to get the visa and then get a divorce. Mm -hmm. And then I think at the end of the two years, I think there was some other process you had to go through, which was just a matter of submitting some sort of form just to acknowledge that you wanted to make your visa permanent. And then they did that. But what was confusing about this was that it was an electronic visa, which meant that I didn't have any sort of actual card. Like in America, you get the green card. There was no real physical proof that I had this visa. <laughs> when you go through the border security, they've got a database somewhere. And when they swipe your passport through, it pulls up your visa so they can see that you're legit. <laughs> now, the tricky thing here is that when I go to other countries, especially a country like New Zealand, which has a understanding, I guess, with Australia, that Australian citizens and New Zealand citizens can pretty much move freely between the two countries. Mm -hmm. But when I went out there on the spouse visa, it was confusing because... I don't remember exactly what happened, but it seemed like they couldn't look up the Australian database or whatever to prove that I had this Australian visa. Uh -huh. And it was probably my number two behind Canada of, of the most difficult border crossings that I've had, <laughs> just trying to explain to these people that I actually had a legitimate spouse visa in Australia. Huh. <laughs> and then, of course, they started asking me about why I was there and why do I have a toolbox and all that kind of stuff, because I was explaining that I was doing work in New Zealand. Now, I realized later on that there is actually a website that you can go on and print out something which is called a, a visa entitlement verification online. All this is is essentially a confirmation that you can print out and keep a physical piece of paper somewhere that says that you've got this visa. But again, I would imagine that if I tried to pull that out at a border crossing, someone would probably just tell me that I could have doctored it or whatever. You know, I can't imagine that it, they'd actually trust that. <laughs> it's something that's just printed off of a web page. So once you got that spouse visa, you didn't get an Australian passport. You just still had your U.S. passport with the Australian visa somewhere in the ether. In the cloud, that's right. So in order to get an Australian passport, I would have to apply for a citizenship. So when you had kids, then they must have been Australian citizens, or were they American, or both? Well, they were born Australian citizens, but they were made Americans. The way it works with the kids is that they're Australian citizens by birth, meaning that they've got birth certificates which have been issued in Australia. And so that part was reasonably easy. But they're also eligible for a dual citizenship because one of their parents is an American citizen, which is me. And we figured that that would be a worthwhile thing to do, given that, like we said before, a, an American passport is sort of a golden ticket to most places in the world. I mean, Australian passport's not bad either, but it never hurts to have your bases covered. So there's a process that we had to go through in order to get the kids registered as American citizens. And it's another similar process to the whole green card thing, although it wasn't quite as bad. Obviously, obviously the kids haven't committed any genocide or moral turpitude yet. At least you haven't caught them for it. Unless certain stains on the wall count as a moral turpitude. <laughs> That's okay. You can remove that with some moral turpentine. And so the paperwork for this process wasn't quite as arduous. And of course, we already had everything on hand after the green card process in America and then the spouse visa process in Australia. However, in order to complete this process, we did have to visit a U.S. consulate in Australia. Adelaide's a great place, but it's unfortunately not a very big city. And so in order to do this, we had to go to another city that actually had a U.S. consulate, which for us, the closest one was Melbourne. So the consulate is basically just a couple of floors 
in an office building in Melbourne. It's a little bit like the process that we had in the U.S. with the U.S. Citizen Services office. However, it's a bit more purpose-built, where instead of just having offices, they've got these special windows that you go to. I think you actually have to leave all your metal stuff at the front desk. So after they scan you, you actually can't bring your phones and boom boxes and belt buckles and stuff in there with you. <laughs> and again, it's one of these things where you, where you have to apply online for an interview time. And they give you an interview, which is something like two months in the future at whatever arbitrary time that they've selected. I think that if you have some pressing concern, there is a way to, to request a different time. But again, that'll probably just be some other randomly allocated time. It's not like you can actually choose when you want to go. And again, it's one of these things where I can't think of very many private organizations I've had to deal with where I've had to book that long in advance and then still have to wait when I get there. I think the only other experience I've had like that was for a hospital visit at the wonderful socialized medical system in Australia. And so having had the two kids and with a few other events, such as renewing my passport, which I had, like I said before, I had filled up my old one, so I had to get a new one. We've made several trips to this consulate over in Melbourne in order to do all this paperwork. The nice thing is that my brother-in-law lives in Melbourne, so when we go there, we do have a place to stay. However, it's always a bit of a hassle getting over there, even though it's only like an hour and a half flight. So one time we went there, we, we all hopped in the car and actually drove it <laughs> with the kids. And of course, they were just going nuts by the time we got there. I think it's like an eight or 10 hour drive or something like that. Yeah. We decided that <laughs> every time after that, that we would fly. Now we got a bit unlucky one time because on the date that they had booked us, it turned out that Tiger Woods was in town for a golf tournament that same day. <laughs> and so all the flights to Melbourne were just completely booked out. <laughs> and we had to pay thousands of dollars for flights to get over there. Oh, <laughs> so, you know, it's this other thing where you, they've got all these fees for all these processes they have to pay. But on top of that, there's all these incidental costs they have to put up with as well. <laughs> and in our case, we had quite a few plane flights that we had to purchase. <laughs> and the funny thing is, once we got in there, like I said, we made a few different trips there, but it seemed like every time we went there, we actually got the same lady that helped us. And I remember that she was actually really nice and helpful and everything. She was really good with the kids. But the funny thing is, even though this lady was really nice and she helped us and everything, I don't know her name. You go in these places and, and nobody has a name. They don't have any name tags or anything like that. It's just, you know, Windows 7. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the lady at Windows 7. It's another one of these things where it's, it's just this completely impersonal process. Yeah. Or again, in, in any private business, you know, you'd never have that unless it was, you know, some sort of telemarketer or something like that. And what was the need to be there in person? Like, why could you just deal with this stuff either through the mail or even online? You do as much as you can online and through the mail. So we had already mailed in all of our applications and stuff, but uh -huh. they require that you show up in person and, you know, flash your passport to someone. I think it's more of just an identity confirmation as well as just they, they kind of walk through the forms and make sure that you've got everything that you need, got everything filled out properly. The nice thing was that we managed to batch some of this stuff so that, for example, when we applied for my first son's passport, it was right around the same time that I needed to renew my passport. And so we were able to do both processes with the same visit. Although I think I did have to go back there again to pick it up or something like that. There's one other funny thing that happened with, I can't remember which process it was, but with one of the processes, for some reason, we had to provide a, like a registered mail envelope so that they could mail us our passports in that envelope yeah. for, with Priority Express Mail or whatever. We hadn't picked one up beforehand, but for whatever reason, you know, we needed it. And this might have been because we were trying to fast track the passport delivery or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And so what happened was we went through the whole process and she told me that the thing to do was to go out and purchase one and then bring it back and go back into the consulate and deliver it to her. Uh -huh. You'd think that they'd just have some of these lying around that you could purchase. Right. <laughs> I probably would have paid double cost for this thing just to not have to go walk around St. Kilda in, in Melbourne and try to find some post office that I could purchase one of these things. <laughs> but luckily there was one just down the road. So my wife waited in the car with the kids while I walked down to this place and picked up this <laughs> envelope and then brought it back and handed it to the security guard so he could bring it upstairs. <laughs> There's an opportunity for improvement, U.S. Consulate, if you're looking to streamline your processes at all. <laughs> and so we got the kids' passports. <laughs> the funny thing is that the kids' passport is good for five years. And so when my son was four or five years old, he's got this passport that's got him as a three-month-old baby. <laughs> and the photo that we got of my son was just a complete mugshot. Because the way they do it, you know, you know with the passport photos, you've got to have your head at just the right size, and not smiling or whatever, which wasn't a problem with him because I think he was pretty grumpy at the time. But 
the way it works when you go to the photo place is I think my wife had to actually hold him like up on her shoulders and she had to duck down so that you couldn't see her. <laughs> and then they had to sort of angle the camera just to get his face in the frame. We've done exactly that with both of our kids. I think both of them were around six months when we did their passports. <laughs> yeah. The same thing. So now their passport photos are, you know, these six-month-old babies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they've got it until they were what, like five years old or something like that. Yep. <laughs> with my older son, he got a new passport when he turned five. And I'll have that. I think that one's good for 10 years. So when he's 15 years old, (laughs) he'll have this passport that's got a photo of him as a five-year-old. Right. (laughs) And so we actually rushed this process a little bit because we had planned to visit the U.S. about six months after each of our kids were born. The way it works is that if you're a dual citizen, whichever country you're entering, you're supposed to use the passport of that country to go in. Mm -hmm. So for example, when we enter the U.S., we show our U.S. passports. And then when we come back to Australia, we show our Australian passports. And I don't know exactly why that is, but for whatever reason, it's the way they like it. It's like I said, just smile for the nice man with the gun and do what he says. So now that your kids were dual citizens, what made you decide to get your Australian citizenship in addition to your U.S. citizenship? To be honest, I didn't really think it through that carefully. (laughs) I didn't really have that many reasons, especially since I was sort of warming up to these ideas of anarchism during this whole time period. It just seemed like the right thing to do. And I have actually written a blog post answering this very question, although possibly not in the form that most people would want to read. It's about 5,000 words long. (laughs) And to be honest, and I'm, I'm not sure if I ever actually answered the question. <laughs> so here you go, podcast listeners. This is a bonus for you. There's a few benefits that I could see to being a citizen. For one thing, when I first came into the country, even though I had a spouse visa, I had tried applying for some jobs, partially because I wanted to get off the road and to settle down a bit more. And also, I was just kind of curious to see what was out there and what the opportunities were. And I had very little success. Now, this, of course, can't be due to my credentials or my competence or anything like that, because obviously I would be an enormously valuable asset to any firm that employed me. (laughs) (laughs) Now, this was around 2008, 2009, so obviously the market was garbage then anyways. There weren't that many great opportunities around. But at the same time, I felt like I was in a position where I was probably at a disadvantage to someone who was just an Australian citizen. Not necessarily for any reasons of bigotry or nationalism and that sort of thing. You know, like, oh, you know, we're going to hire an Australian instead of an American with a spouse visa. (laughs) I don't think it was anything like that. I think it's more just that extra uncertainty of hiring someone who's got a provisional spouse visa. They might hire me and then, for all they know, I could get divorced in the next six months and then be shipped off back to the U.S. Yeah. So there's some risk there to hiring me. And I've heard stories like this. Again, like I've said, we've got some friends in the U.S. who have had spouses from other countries. And I know that they've had a lot of difficulty trying to get jobs in the U.S. Maybe not once they've had the green card, but certainly prior to getting the green card. Technically, they're not supposed to work, I guess, if they're on a tourist visa or something. Mm -hmm. So I felt that having a citizenship would just give me sort of that extra leg up in the job market, I guess, where it was just one less headache for anyone who Mm -hmm. I was applying for. And related to that, if I wanted to start a business in Australia, especially with specific kinds of businesses, there are some requirements where you, you need to be a citizen in order to start the business. Now, this isn't true across the board. In fact, prior to my becoming a citizen, I did get what's called an ABN, an Australian business number, which essentially means that I can operate as some sort of an independent contractor within Australia and file taxes. This is after I had left the planetarium industry, but I was still doing some contract work to support some of the planetariums in Australia. And related to that, Australia has something called the Foreign Investment Relations Board or something like that, FIRB. And what they do is they try to regulate foreign investment in Australian companies and properties and that sort of thing. Now, I looked into this when we were buying our house out here because I wasn't sure if I would be able to put my name on the house or if we'd just have to put it under my wife's name because I wasn't sure with this foreign investment thing if, if there was some additional paperwork that we'd have to do there. Now, it turns out that there is an exemption for people on a spouse visa that there's not really any challenge to them owning property in joint with their spouse or something like that. But it's another thing where who knows what's going to happen down the road it's just another hurdle that I don't want to have to deal with later on. Yeah. So those are a few of the practical reasons why I did it. But there was one other reason, which is probably a bit more speculative and, 
and probably sounds a bit ridiculous, but it's actually a fear of some sort of like nationalist revolution <laughs> where they kick out all the immigrants or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty far-fetched. Or for example, let's say that the US and China went to war against each other and Australia realized that they've got quite a lot of trade with China, but not so much with the US. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually realize who butters their bread these days and decided to side with China. <laughs> I didn't want to be the guy who gets put into the internment camp for being a suspected American spy or whatever. <laughs> And look, I mean, this, you know, this is obviously just ridiculous speculation, and it's nothing that I ever took seriously at the time. But a little bit later, I want to talk about a situation that I think actually makes this more probable than it might seem otherwise. And beyond any actual consequences that might come about, there certainly is in the U.S. There are a large number of people who are very prejudiced against immigrants, even even legal immigrants. Yeah. Um, there are people who just you know, think we should shut down the borders and... <laughs> Whoever's in now gets to stay, and anybody else has to stay out. Yeah, and Australia certainly has the same thing. I mean, there's a political party called the Nationals. That's basically their platform. Nationalism and keep the boats out, keep the immigrants out. It's not quite as blatant and xenophobic as that, but I mean, there's certainly an element of that there, and there, there are certainly people within the country who are that bigoted. You mean patriotic. Once you decided to get your citizenship, what was the process that you had to go through there? First of all, I couldn't start the process until I had already been in the country on the spouse visa for five years. And the funny thing is that before I came to Australia, this time limit was three years. And it seemed like as soon as I arrived, they changed it to five. <laughs> so <laughs> They sniffed you out. They saw me coming. And my take on the citizenship process was that it was, it was actually much easier than the spouse visa process. But it was still quite a bit of paperwork and, and a bit of a process that I had to go through. Um, and it could have been, again, just because I had already been through this process so many times before that I had all the information on hand, and so it wasn't too bad. <laughs> so when I was going through the application form, I was just pulling information off of the previous visa applications, which I still had sitting around. It was a pretty simple process. There was a fee of, I think it was like 200 bucks or something like that. It wasn't anything too onerous. And probably the most difficult thing I had to do was find someone to be a referee. And what that meant was they had a list of people who could be a referee, now, it had to be someone who wasn't a direct family member, which included, I guess, my wife's family. There's any number of different credentials that the person could have had. So, for example, they could have been like a notary public or a justice of the peace or something like that, or a registered attorney or a registered doctor or any employee of the Australian government. What worked out for me was that it could be anyone who was a member of Engineers Australia, which is similar to something like ASME or IEEE or something like that in the US. So it, it's essentially just an Australian industry group. So essentially anyone who's registered as a professional engineer in Australia could have been a referee as well. So it turned out that we did have a couple guys in my company who were professional engineers and who are current members of Engineers Australia. And the funny thing is I went to one guy and I got him to sign it and everything. And the way they do this is you bring your photo from your application, which is again, it's just like a passport photo. And they have to actually write, hand write on the back of the photo, they have to write like, this is a true photo of Joe, uh -huh. and then sign their initials or something like that. And then there's another form that they have to fill out a couple of yes, no questions, and then sign their name, <laughs> you know, just to say that they've known me for so many years and that sort of thing. And it's not really that they're vouching for me or anything like that. It's more just that they're vouching for my identity right. and that I am the person I say I am, and to make sure that I'm not my twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you should have had you get me citizenship while you were over there. <laughs> I'll take two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, now the funny thing was that the first guy I went to, it turns out that he wasn't actually an Australian citizen. <laughs> and so he went through this whole process. And it was literally like the day that I had my, my interview and my test <laughs> that I realized that I had to get someone else to do this. <laughs> and as it turned out, the other guy, the one other guy in the company who could do this, was in a HAZOP meeting, an all-day HAZOP meeting on the day, <laughs> on this day that I had to get this thing signed. And, and it was it was the sort of thing where my appointment was at 2 p.m. or something like that in the city. Uh -huh. And you know, this guy was in this meeting all day, and I'm sitting there going, oh, "Man, what do I do?" <laughs> so, right. So I'm walking past the meeting room every like 10 minutes, just hoping he's going to come out and take a leak or something like that so I can grab him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but eventually I just bit the bullet and, and walked in there, interrupted the meeting, you know, and we've got, and then a HAZOP meeting is where they go through and they identify all kinds of risks and safety risks and hazardous areas and stuff like that at the site. And it's a pretty serious thing where they, they have a, a third party facilitator that runs a meeting. You've got representatives from the customer there. You, we might have some representatives from 
from suppliers or vendors, you know, equipment vendors and that sort of thing, as well as all of our lead engineers and, and some of our senior management. So, so interrupting <laughs> this thing, you know, it, it was a bit intimidating, kind of, kind of knocking on that door, walking in that room and just trying to pull this guy out of the meeting. <laughs> right. He was a pretty good sport and he, he came out and did it. And apparently he had done it before for a couple of, of other people. So, uh-huh. yeah. And so that afternoon I had my interview and my test. So it's the same sort of thing. You submit your application and then you wait four weeks to be told that you've got an appointment and then you wait another three weeks for the appointment or something like that. And then you walk yeah. in there and you still got to wait once you get there. <laughs> so I went through that whole rigmarole. And the way it works, it's they do the interview, which again, it's, it's pretty low key. It's basically just to make sure that you fill out all your forms properly. There's a 20 question, multiple choice test that you have to take, which you do. They've just got a little computer there that you sit on and go through it. The lady was actually surprised at all the documentation that I had. You know, she's like, oh, wow, you're really organized. It's like, yeah, I've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> Been through this a few times before with all the visas, passports, green cards, and everything. Uh-huh. I knew the drill. So what was this test like? You said it was like 20 questions. Did you have to like identify all the different kinds of marsupials and tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile or what? Well, what happens is you go into the room and there's a kangaroo sitting there with boxing gloves. <laughs> you got to hold your own in the ring with him for three minutes <laughs> before they'll let you take the test. <laughs> and then they throw you in the crocodile pit, right, to wrestle a croc? That's just a typical commute across town anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so after all the physical tests, <laughs> I got to sit down at the computer terminal and take my 20-question multiple-choice test. Now, there's a booklet that you can get. It's kind of like when you take your driver's test and you've got this booklet that you can read through and it's basically got all the answers in it. And they have some practice tests that you can do online. So what I had done is the night before, I, I was just going to go in and wing it, but I figured, you know, I've put all this time into this thing. I might as well just read the stupid book. It would be so <laughs> stupid to catch myself now if they ask some weird question that I haven't thought of, you know, uh-huh. and get something wrong. <laughs> so so the night before, I decided to cram, and, it, and it's only like a 20-page book or something like that. This, you know, apparently, there's not much to becoming an Australian citizen. <laughs> And so I read this booklet the night before and then took a few of the practice tests and was pretty confident going in there. And so once I got in, I sat down at the desk and in less than three minutes I had finished and was back at her desk with my results. Uh (laughs) And I aced it, you know, 100%, 20 for 20. (laughs) (laughs) So what I took away from that was that Australians have pretty low standards for who they actually allow to become one of them. It seems like that with a lot of these government approval processes is that the actual criteria or you know proof of your knowledge or character or whatever is pretty minimal i mean to the point that it probably doesn't actually weed out anybody who gets to that point i mean it's not like they're excluding people because you know they don't know what the national tree of australia is yeah and that's the sort of stuff that's on the test some of it is actually that that ridiculous like you know what colors are on the flag for torres strait islanders or something like that which is a particular aboriginal group in australia it's in the book, so I knew it. But it's stuff that has nothing to do with, of course, anybody's ability to be a good citizen or whatever. Yeah, that's right. It's just, you know, making you jump through hoops for the purpose of making you jump through hoops. Yeah, I mean, they have stuff that's like fifth grade level civics class stuff. What's the form of government of Australia? Oh, it's a, it's a I forget what they call it, a representative monarchy or something like that. <laughs> I think they had some stuff about checks and balances or voting or something. I've probably got a sarcastic answer for all these, you know, but right. luckily it was multiple choice and not an essay test. <laughs> <laughs> so then was that the last step in the process once you pass this silly test? Well, pretty much. But after that, again, it was another five or six weeks or something like that that I had to wait until I could actually have the ceremony and become a citizen. Because what they do is they batch it so they get a bunch of people becoming citizens at the same time. You know, so obviously it's just this one big ceremony. And so... There were probably 40 or 50 people that were all being naturalized at my ceremony. They have it in a city hall. They get a couple of no-name politicians to come out and give a couple of meaningless speeches. They get someone from like the local Rotary Club or whatever to come up and invite you to join the Rotary to participate in the community. We got a little bag with all kinds of swag from like the local town. Like, you know, th- th- there's a CD of, of the local town orchestra <laughs> playing some of their music. I've got like a bike water bottle, which is pretty good. I use that (laughs) with the city's Uh, logo on it. uh, That whole process paid for itself. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, while you're there getting your citizenship, you walk in and they've got a table right there where you can register to vote. Before I was even naturalized as a citizen, I was registered to vote (laughs) in Australia, (laughs) which, of course, in Australia, it's mandatory. You know, so if I hadn't gone through that process... I guess they would have chased me down or something. (laughs) The culmination of the ceremony is that everyone has to recite the Australian Pledge of Allegiance or whatever it's called. 
Um, <laughs> What's that? Asi, asi, asi. Oi, oi, oi. Asi, asi, asi. Oi, oi, oi. I don't know what everyone else is saying, but that's what I was doing. <laughs> I got some funny looks. Um, but they did like my spirit. Didn't he read the booklet? They actually had it printed on a little booklet, like the program for the event when you go in. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's kind of funny is you can choose. It's kind of like in the U.S., you know, the, the U.S. pledge where there's this whole thing about whether you say the words under God. Uh-huh. So there's a similar, th- I think it's the same, same somewhere in the pledge. I mean, to be honest, I don't know the pledge at all or the national anthem or whatever of Australia. There's actually a box somewhere that you have to check as to whether or not you want to say the words under God when you say the pledge. Did you say it? Well, I figured if I was signing up for one imaginary construct, why not have it witnessed by another? So now that you've gone through this whole process and jumped through all these hoops and crammed for the test, and gotten it all done and become a citizen. Fought the kangaroo. <laughs> right. What are the benefits that you get from that now that you didn't have before? It's actually not a lot. Before I became a citizen, I had access to the Australian healthcare system, which is socialized, as well as welfare programs or family assistance programs. I had an Australian driver's license. So really, in terms of actual kind of economic benefits, for the most part, I already had all that just with the spouse visa. And that spouse visa was good forever at that point, right? It was provisional for a while, and then after two years or something, you had to kind of reconfirm it, but then it was Uh basically permanent after that. So yeah, so I had this permanent spouse visa, and I've kind of given my reasons already for why I wanted to do the citizenship. But the actual benefits that are conferred upon you when you become a citizen, of course, the most obvious one is that now I have the right to be forced to vote, (laughs) which of course, (laughs) in Australia, voting is compulsory. So it's not like I have the right to vote, I have the responsibility to vote now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so what happens if you don't vote? Do they, uh, what do they send some guys to your house or something with a ballot? <laughs> tie you down and make you fill it out? Check the box, son. I think it's something like, a, I don't know, $50 fine or something like that. You know, it's nothing really special. And I, I think I do know a few people who say they just don't bother to vote and they just pay the fine. Can it be like history class in college where you go and have your friend sign you in, you know, that you were there in the morning when you're still sleeping in? <laughs> well, pretty much. I, like, I don't think I had to show any ID or anything because we actually had an election just a few months ago. And I went in to do the vote. Of course, I, you know, I had to stand in line for like 45 minutes waiting to go sign into this thing. You go in there and they've just got a printed out list with everyone's name on it in the district. So I go in there, I tell her my name. And it's the sort of thing like you see in movies where someone's trying to sneak into a party or something and they, they've got the list there, the guest list. And they just pick out the right. name from the guest list and say, oh, that's me. <laughs> yeah. It was just like that. It could have been anyone, you know? Yeah. I actually found my name on the list for her, pointed out to her. I said, oh, that's me right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think that's how they do it in Massachusetts, too. Yeah. I mean, it's been an issue here that, you know, the talk radio guys want to have people that you have to present an ID in order to vote. Right. I'm trying to remember if they if I had to present an ID or not. I don't think I did. For one reason, I actually knew the guy who was checking the names off at the voting booth. Oh, yeah. He was one of my neighbors who had volunteered, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so I don't think I presented an ID, but I don't remember if they if they make people do that or not. I think it might depend state by state. I think some states do that and some states don't. Yeah, I mean, you've heard all these stories about probably both Democrat and Republican parties that you know, do all kinds of rigging and... You know, they, they figure out people who are dead but are still in the election rolls and get someone to go in and vote for them. And there's all kinds of stuff like that that goes on. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I actually, <laughs> I forget who I was talking to, but somebody who knew somebody in, in politics, like a relative or something. And he said they used to like go around the neighborhood to all the el- elderly people yeah. who weren't going to make it out to vote. Yeah. and order them an absentee ballot, right. fill it out for them and send it in for yeah. <laughs> whoever the candidate was. <laughs> I mean, come on. There's all kinds of stuff like that that goes on. The amount of faith people have in this electoral system is just astounding. So another benefit of citizenship is, again, I guess the right, or I guess more like the responsibility to participate in jury duty. Mm-hmm which I haven't been called on yet, but um, who knows? Hopefully I never do. (laughs) (laughs) So beyond being on a jury, what happens if you actually get called into court, if you're a a suspect or if you're getting sued by somebody? Does it make a difference if you're a citizen or not? Kind of what rights you have in court and how you get treated? Uh, I have no idea, actually. <laughs> never thought of, I've never intended to commit any crimes. I never really put that much thought into it. <laughs> You've never intended to not vote? <laughs> well, actually, I'll post my original blog post called Why I Became an Australian Citizen. 
And I've just recently appended to that a photo of my actual ballot from the last election. So if you want to see how I voted, <laughs> have a look at that blog post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing you weren't uh, with the winning party. <laughs> Let's just say that when there was a hung parliament after the election, I actually felt like my vote mattered. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I voted in the last presidential election, I had my son with me who was, I think, about 11 months old at the time. And so I just put the pen in his hand, had him fill out the ballot for me. <laughs> so I guess that would have felt like my vote had counted if the president was currently the guitar player from the Wiggles. <laughs> Well, too bad he's Australian. <laughs> Actually, back in, I think it was 2008 when Obama was first running, I was at a Stevie Wonder concert, and this is in Australia, of course, and in the middle of the concert, Stevie starts chanting, Obama, 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 and like the whole audience is just up on their feet cheering, yeah, Obama, 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 you know, because <laughs> everyone in Australia you know, wishes they could vote in the U.S. elections. Yeah. And I was looking around, I'm going, oh my God, there's an opportunity here. I could auction my vote on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I could probably make some money out of this thing. These idiots actually think this thing has some value. <laughs> but then I looked it up. I actually went home and did some homework on it. But apparently some kid in Michigan or something had done this. He had put his vote up on eBay. You know, you say something like, whoever wins the auction, tell me how to vote and that's how I'll vote, that sort of thing. Right. And uh, I don't know if he got arrested or what, but he got in a lot of trouble for, they got him under some sort of like bribery and racketeering laws, some God. old state yeah. law or something like that. So it's that sort of thing, you know, you just, all right, no, it's not worth the joke. <laughs> right. <laughs> other than voting and jury duty, what are there any other benefits you get from being a citizen? Well, I guess the other benefit, or again, probably more responsibility in certain contexts would be, I guess, the right to join the military which obviously I have very little interest in doing. They don't have like any mandatory military service or anything there, do they? No, not in Australia. It's it's all it's just like the US pretty much where it's it's voluntary. Have they ever had a draft in Australia? Uh, I, I don't know my history well enough. They probably have, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if they did, you know, ever again as well. <laughs> so if the US went to war with Australia and both countries had a draft, could they both draft you to fight against yourself? <laughs> I don't think either of them would want me. <laughs> <laughs> I've played paintball a few times, and I'm god-awful at it. <laughs> <laughs> so you have mandatory voting, mandatory jury duty, and possibly mandatory military service. These are the benefits that you've got for becoming a citizen. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Is that it? Else? I think that's about it. I, yeah, to be honest, I didn't do a whole lot of homework when I decided to become a citizen. <laughs> Another thing that I thought might have been a benefit of Australian citizenship was the ability to travel to British Commonwealth countries without needing a visa or having the ability to stay there and work without having to go through a whole visa process. However, I've done a little research since then and it turns out that's not quite the case. You're hoping to get back into Canada more easily than you did the last time? <laughs> I've been plotting my return. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should just become a Canadian citizen too. I don't think that'd have me. <laughs> A lot of Australians think I'm Canadian anyways, because apparently they're expecting me to have like a southern accent or something like that. And because I have, a, I guess, a northern accent, <laughs> they think I'm Canadian. <laughs> you know, walk around in a cowboy hat and spurs. <laughs> <laughs> There's cowboys in Canada, right? Isn't that what Brokeback Mountain was about? That's not exactly what Brokeback Mountain was about. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Brokeback Mountain? <laughs> Brokeback Mountain wasn't about Canadian cowboys. So now, even though you live in Australia and you're an Australian citizen, you still have to pay some U.S. taxes, don't you? So the way it works is that I'm actually a dual citizen. The U.S. does allow dual citizenship, which means that unless I actually go and renounce my U.S. citizenship, which means you have to walk into an embassy, there's probably some form you fill out, and then declare in front of some bureaucrat that, that you've renounced your citizenship to the U.S. <laughs> Unless you actually go and formally do that, then I retain my U.S. citizenship. You have to, like, throw your passport on the ground and spit on it or something? <laughs> I'm out! <laughs> <laughs> really, becoming a citizen doesn't, again, it's, it's like kind of like with the benefits, it doesn't really change my taxes at all. So I was already paying Australian tax on my Australian income and U.S. tax on my U.S. income. And mm -hmm. in addition to that, I think I've said before, in the U.S., I have to file taxes and report all of my global income, even though it could all be outside the U.S., and even though I'm outside the U.S. So as it turns out, there's only two countries in the world who 
tax people based on citizenship as opposed to residency. One of them <laughs> is the U.S., and the other one is Eritrea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's an elite group. Yeah, they're really the <laughs> vanguard of tax authorities. Huh? Yeah. In Eritrea, it's only something like a 2% flat tax on any foreign income or something like that. So <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should become an Eritrean citizen. <laughs> Still wouldn't get me out of my U.S. taxes. (laughs) Now, this is something that I've actually, that I'm a little bit concerned about because obviously, you know, my kids, I've signed them up to be dual citizens. So even if they never set foot in the U.S. and never earn any U.S. income, they're U.S. citizens. So I guess technically, when they start earning money, they'll have to file U.S. tax returns just because they're citizens. How could you do that to them? (laughs) So it's something that I'm a little bit conflicted about, obviously signing them up before they even you know, could speak English or whatever. <laughs> I guess they can always renounce it later. However, if you do renounce your citizenship under a U.S. law, you still have to file your tax return for 10 years after you have expatriated. Seriously? Yeah. Do you still have to pay taxes for 10 years? I don't think you actually have to pay them, but you have to report them. So basically it shows that you're not just like hiding money somewhere or something for like the whole time you're a citizen. Yeah, it's something like that. It's just ridiculous. I mean, that alone is a big reason why I wouldn't renounce my U.S. citizenship. Just because it's like, well, what? what's the point? I still have to, it's still going to be 10 years that I have to keep doing right. this, you know, filing these returns. And I might as well have the benefit of being able to enter and exit the country <laughs> whenever I want to. Right. I mean, the benefit, is <laughs> meaning that somebody won't shoot me for doing that. <laughs> so that process of expatriation, there's a tax form that you have to submit in which you have to list all of your current assets, liabilities, and tax history. And then, like I said, you still have to file a U.S. tax return for the next 10 years. So this is even after you're no longer a citizen? That's like on the day you renounce your citizenship or whatever, you've got to submit <laughs> this form that spells out, okay, these are all the assets I have all over the world you know, for the oh, U.S. To, to keep an eye on or whatever. It's just, it's ridiculous, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, where do, where do they get off? It's a complete violation of the Fourth Amendment, which is the right to your property and papers or something like that right. security in <laughs> Secu- your, yeah, exactly. security in your papers or <laughs> or affairs or right. whatever it is yeah, however it was worded in the 1700s well of course you know nationalists would argue that the constitution doesn't apply to non-citizens so if you're no longer a citizen <laughs> they could ask you for whatever they want i guess yeah well if the, if the constitution doesn't apply then neither do the laws in my opinion if you're not in the country <laughs> <laughs> I've done a little bit of research on this because I've been curious as to, okay, what if you did do this and then you just didn't file the returns? Or even in my position right now where, let's say I didn't have any U.S. source income, I only had my Australian income, and I just didn't file my U.S. tax returns. And I'm sure that there are tons of of American expats or people like me who are dual citizens that just don't even know about this stuff. I mean, I only found out about it because I was looking up all this stuff about tax avoidance and, and how to hide your money and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the problem. You start digging into that stuff, you realize that there's actually more taxes you should be filing yeah, for. And paying. That's exactly right. I wouldn't have known. I, you know, I, I'm probably paying more taxes now because I was because I actually found out about all this stuff right. <laughs> from reading websites like that. And of course, I'll never be wealthy enough to actually take part in any of those kind of schemes. Right. It's the sort of thing where if you buy a house in Panama or something like that, then you can gain automatic citizenship down there and mm-hmm. stash all your money in Panama or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You want to have running water, but you could... <laughs> yeah, you want to have running water, but you have plenty of liquid assets. <laughs> and filing this tax return in the U.S. as well, I think I might have mentioned on the podcast before, when I do my tax return every year, I submit a 15-page tax return. And usually I'm reporting zero taxable income. (laughs) So if I was actually in the U.S., if you're within the U.S. and you have zero income to report, you don't actually have to file a return. But because I'm outside the U.S., every U.S. citizen outside the U.S., regardless of whether or not you actually have enough income to pay taxes, you have to file a return. Uh I spend probably a week every year doing this tax, and I've got to work out my Australian income. And so it's tricky because the Australian tax year goes from July to June, where, of course, the U.S. tax year goes from January to December. When I look back at my annual tax or or at my annual income on my pay stubs, I've got to work it out differently for the U.S. than I do from Australia. Hmm. Plus, you have to convert the currency. (laughs) The weird thing is there's actually a tax treaty between the U.S. and Australia that explicitly states that the U.S. won't tax Australian income and vice versa. However, everything I've read about this says you still have to report it and file your return. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, there's nowhere on the forms that you can 
tick a box or something like that just to say, you know, this falls under the Australian tax treaty, so it's exempt or something like that. Uh, yeah. I've got to go through it as if it's any other income. So it's as if the tax treaty doesn't even exist when you're filling out the return. Right. They use that income, even though I don't get taxed on it in the U.S., they use it to determine my tax bracket. So for any income that I do earn in the U.S., I'll get taxed at the higher bracket based on my Australian income. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's just a, it's taxes. Beyond the taxes, don't you also have to file some other thing to report how much money you have? Yeah, so there's a form called, I think now it's called FinCEN Form 116, for those of you keeping score at home. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Which is more commonly referred to as the FBAR, which stands for Foreign Bank Account Reporting. (laughs) You sure that's not the FUBAR? I call it the Fourth Bloody Amendment Repealed. (laughs) (laughs) And you have to file this if you have any foreign bank accounts or other investments or anything like that totaling over $10,000. So if you're in Australia and let's say you've got maybe five grand in the bank and then five grand in a investment account or something like that somewhere, then you'd have to file this form. And, and what it is, is it's essentially just reporting. You have to report the highest balance in each of your offshore accounts within the previous tax year. And of course, it's tricky again with exchange rates and all that because the exchange rates are constantly changing. You've got to report all these in U.S. dollars. You've got to work out the combination of exchange rates and the actual balance in your account. (laughs) What was the highest balance you had throughout the year? (laughs) And there's different ways to do that. I think with the exchange rates, the IRS posts an average exchange rate for each currency that covers the whole year. And so I think you can use that Uh and then take your highest balance and multiply it by that to get your balance in U.S. dollars. Yeah, but it's just ridiculous because just a normal bank account in Australia, which is just your normal checking account or savings account or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. that's an offshore account to the U.S. as far as they're concerned. You know, you might as well have a a Swiss bank account or there are some money stashed in Panama or (laughs) something like that. Now, being a good libertarian, I do I do want a little bit of gold bullion, which is through one of these online platforms. The one I use is gold money. And what this is, is, is there's some gold in a vault somewhere. I think there's some in Switzerland, Hong Kong. You can choose where you want to store your gold that you own. Um, Uh (laughs) And I've got to report that every year. They treat that as essentially a foreign currency as well. Now, luckily with gold money, what they do is they've actually started, you can download a form from them that will tell you exactly the number that you need to put in for this form. Hmm. So it'll say your your highest balance throughout the year in gold was whatever it is in US dollars. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's a nice courtesy that they offer. Hmm. Otherwise, it's pretty tricky to gauge because again, the gold prices is, is always moving up and down as well. This is something that would affect people who are still living in the United States if they just end up with some kind of investment vehicle that is housed, I guess, outside of the United States. For whatever reason, there's some savings account or some investment or, or, or like you said, the gold money thing. Yeah. There could be people within the U.S. who may not even know that their account is an offshore account that is supposed to be reporting this thing. Yeah, absolutely. And anyone who's got, you know, say 10,000 bucks in a gold account or something like that, like you said, yeah, even if you're in the U.S., you'd have to file this form every year. And again, (laughs) now this form, this actually was introduced as part of the Patriot Act. So, of course, the original intent was, oh, we're going to go after the terrorists with it. We're going to use it to, to freeze the terrorist assets, you know. Right. How's that going? <laughs> I mean, how many terrorists do you think are actually filling out their FBAR forms and, and submitting them every <laughs> right. July, you know? Be a fucking break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think the Prince of Saud is filling out his <laughs> FBAR form for the U.S. <laughs> yeah, good old Prince Bandar. And the thing is, if you don't file it, the fine for this thing is ridiculous. I think the way they define it is it's the greater of $10,000 or half of the offshore assets that you haven't reported. So in other words, if you've got 30000 bucks in US dollars in an Australian bank account, you forget to file the form one year, uh-huh. they'll come after you for fifteen grand oh, just for, for not filing this just form. Just for not doing this little piece of yeah. paperwork. Yeah. It has nothing to do with taxes or anything. No, nothing. How has that held up? I mean, how has that not been challenged in court and everything? I mean, it's like, you know, people got in a in a huff over like Obamacare charging people a hundred bucks for not buying health insurance. How do they justify this this seizure? Well, it's because they can take offshore assets and the way they spin it is, is oh, these are fat cats that have all their money overseas. They're hiding them from the U.S. tax man. So we're going to go after them. And then you, the American taxpayer, won't have to pay as much taxes because we're going to get it from these these fat cats who are investing offshore trying to evade taxes, right? Right, sure. But I mean... Well, here's the thing. There's actually another law that was introduced a little bit after that, which is called 
FATCA, F-A-T-C-A, which of course everyone says, you know, the fat cat act or law or whatever like this. And what it does is it imposes all these burdens, even on foreign banks, that they have to essentially participate in this as well and report the assets of any U.S. citizen to the U.S. government. Huh, right. <laughs> I've heard stories where banks just won't take on U.S. citizens as customers because they don't want the headaches. I still don't understand how this could pass constitutional muster to the extent that anything actually has to be constitutional. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, how has somebody, assuming that they have actually prosecuted and gone after people to get these fines of, you know, half of their assets, yeah. how has that been held up in court? I mean, what... These are people who haven't committed a crime other than filling out the stupid form. And, you know, it's like getting arrested for resisting arrest. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's, like, <laughs> it's totally disproportionate. Yeah, exactly. It's the kind of thing where it's the letter of the law. And so if you don't comply, it's right there in black and white. Well, it says right here, here's the fine. You knew ahead of time. You didn't fill out the form. So it's cut and dry. You know, what's the judge going to say? Right. So all you can do is go after the law itself. And of course, that's a much more difficult process. That's what I mean. I'm surprised that hasn't happened yet. It probably has. I'm sure there's been people who have challenged this, but, you know, yeah. it's still there. Wow. <laughs> so how well does that judicial system work? Yeah, how's that constitution working out for you? <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's another one of these things where there's this presumed guilt that anyone offshore is trying to evade taxes right. or trying to hide their assets or, or money laundering or whatever. It comes back to the same kind of theme that we've been discussing throughout this series. Now, one thing that, that we should define, too, is... A lot of people don't understand that there is a difference between what's called tax evasion and tax avoidance. Tax evasion means that you make some money and you intentionally don't report it on your tax return. So you, you try to hide it from the tax man, right? That's tax evasion. Now, if you ask me, that's not actually a crime. That's actually a heroic act that you're doing when you do that. <laughs> right. Anything you can do to keep money out of the hands of the government. But the guys with the guns might have something different to say about that. Yeah, I had solar panels put on my house to avoid the taxes. Yeah, well, see, but that's not tax evasion. That's tax avoidance. And the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance is that tax avoidance is when what you do is technically legal. Here's a simple example. If you buy something at a duty-free shop, you're engaging in tax avoidance. You're avoiding paying taxes on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Or if you live in Massachusetts and you come up to New Hampshire to shop tax-free, then uh, that's mm -hmm. tax avoidance too. And actually, if you don't, I think you're supposed to report that on your return. So if you don't report it, then that's tax evasion. Right. You Massachusetts Democrats. What I love hearing about is when some Boston Herald journalist or something goes up to the liquor store in New Hampshire and catches all the politicians filling up their trunks <laughs> <laughs> with booze from the, the New Hampshire liquor store tax-free and then going back down to Massachusetts. Uh, yep. <laughs> so when I'm talking about these websites that I was, that I was reading before trying to figure out you know, my tax avoidance schemes, that's what that stuff's all about is is how do you actually position your offshore assets so that they're safe from the U.S. government. I mean, one way to do that is to put it into a, an Australian investment account because there is that tax treaty in place. So now, of course, you're not avoiding any taxes there because you pay more tax in Australia than you will in, in the U.S. Right. <laughs> for those assets. Choose your poison. But uh, th there's other places I think you can go that are a bit friendlier to capital. <laughs> you know, I mentioned how we were in Brussels when they had the lockdown there after the Paris attacks. And World events seem to be following us around on this trip. And I think around the time we were in Panama, they had this whole Panama paper thing come out yeah. where they basically revealed that someone in Panama was housing all of these offshore accounts for politicians and you know these ultra-rich people that they were basically hiding money in in order to avoid the reporting and, and taxation on these accounts. Right. So here you have the, these politicians who come up with all these ridiculous laws like FBAR forms and FATCA and all this garbage. <laughs> Meanwhile, they've got their own assets offshore in Panama or whatever, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> telling nobody about it. These offshore banking centers like Panama or even Switzerland, or I'm sure there's plenty of others around as well. They only exist because, because of all these ridiculous tax regimes that they have throughout the world. And so there are places like Panama or, I don't know, Liechtenstein or some of these tiny, or even maybe Singapore. I don't really know the details of which ones are, uh, are real kind of tax havens. Right, it's like the Cayman Islands. And... Yeah, Cayman Islands and all that stuff. So all these places exist and, <laughs> and have probably a disproportionate GDP because they have all this capital flowing into them. That's just people trying to keep their money safe from the iron claws of the government. And people get worked up about, oh, this, this person is hiding their money or saving their money. They're not investing it in American businesses or whatever. 
<laughs> maybe if you gave them some more incentive to keep it here and invest it without penalizing them for it, you know, maybe they would keep a little bit more money in the country. You know, people get pissed off about like Apple computers. They've got it set up so that all of their income shows up in Ireland or something like that. Like the worldwide income <laughs> shows up in Ireland so they don't pay any U.S. tax. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> To me, that's just a heroic act that they're doing. <laughs> that's probably the only reason I would buy an Apple product. <laughs> <laughs> and our podcast just got dropped. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, it's like you have all of these offshore tax havens being created because of the obtrusive tax policies of all these countries. And so it's really these tax policies that are creating this industry of kind of underground banking. And, you know, when you talk about funding terrorists, well, guess where they're going for their money? They're going to go to the banks that are already in place as tax havens because those are the only ones that can give them the privacy that they want to fund their nefarious activities. So you would imagine that if you don't have the incentive for all of this tax avoidance, tax evasion, whatever it is, where you're setting up these clandestine banks, I guess they are, then it's going to make it much harder for people who actually do want to do something bad with their money, to find a place that will support them. Whereas if you have these banks that are already helping people just to avoid taxes, well, they're already breaking the law. So, so why not just take it up a notch and work with people who are funding terrorists? Well, not even that, but they probably even have it set up so that they don't even necessarily know whose money they're taking in some cases. I mean, I don't really know how any of this stuff works, but it would seem to me if I'm some Swiss bank or something like that, and there's a potential that some, you know, Saudi prince or whatever is going to start funding terrorism through my bank. I don't even want to know about it, right? I mean, I want plausible deniability if, <laughs> if I'm that Swiss banker. Right. And, and I'm sure there's, some of this stuff is set up like that. You know, they've got just, instead of having names on accounts, they're just numbered accounts, that sort of thing. Right. And again, that's, you know, banking privacy is not necessarily a bad thing. Right. But if there wasn't this strong incentive to avoid taxes and to fund these banks, I think there would be a much less robust industry in underground banking, which is the exact thing that all of this FinCEN, FBAR, FUBAR stuff is trying to stop in the first place. <laughs> one other concern that I have is if I were to forget to, to file one of these forms one year, whether or not the next time I went into the U.S., if they pick me up at the border and, and hold me there and you know, scold me for not filling in my <laughs> F-bar form or whatever it is. They like hold you upside down by your ankles and shake all the coins out of your pockets to see what you have. <laughs> yeah. But I want, you know, that's the sort of thing that, especially if I were to expatriate and renounce my U.S. citizenship, then I wonder, would that make it hard for me to get a visa to get back into the U.S. later on if I didn't comply with this 10 years of filing tax returns? From what I've seen on the internet, it sounds like they don't really enforce this, at least not that way. But, you know, who knows? <laughs> That's right now. This is the sort of thing, like the, the law's on the book. So eventually someone will figure out, well, we can just stop people at the border and make sure they've paid their taxes. Why not? In episode six, we questioned the effectiveness and unintended consequences of border controls. And one of the points you made there is that when you make immigration illegal that guarantees that immigrants will be criminals. So people who want to come to a country for any length of time and are willing to take the risk of living outside of the system will avoid things like taxation and, you know, getting a driver's license and, and break all kinds of other laws like minimum wage laws. And again, they might not actually be doing anything wrong from a moral standpoint. You know, they might just be coming here to work. But if they're here illegally, they're going to live outside the system and create this underground subculture that subverts authority. There are some libertarians out there who get really down on, on illegal immigrants and, you know, they have this kind of nationalistic streak that, you know, we should have tight borders and that even if we have a kind of libertarian state here, that we should still limit the number of people who are able to come and participate in that so that the system doesn't get overwhelmed or whatever. If you're a libertarian, I mean, you should look at these illegal immigrants as like some kind of libertarian anarchist heroes, <laughs> because these are guys who are actually subverting the system, avoiding government, you know, <laughs> not, not paying, paying taxes. taxes. Like, they're these kind of renegade <laughs> libertarians. I don't think that's probably where their political theory is. <laughs> but in practice, you know, they're doing all these things that, that libertarians always say that people should do. Oh, you know, don't pay your taxes or at least avoid your avoid taxes and <laughs> and don't submit to unjust laws and, and victimless crimes and all if you this. don't love it, leave it. 
<laughs> if you don't love it, leave it. Yeah, I mean, these guys are, are the vanguard of libertarianism. <laughs> So we covered a lot of that in episode six, but in this episode, we want to have a look at some other issues on a broader scale. And the first one is a phenomenon known as anchor babies. What this is, is where, let's say someone comes from Mexico into the U.S., they'll actually have a baby that's born in the U.S., and by birthright, the baby is a U.S. citizen. And then what they do is they use that baby's citizenship to get visas and possibly citizenship for the parents who have come over from Mexico. And so this is, again, it just sounds like a great libertarian loophole. I mean, hopefully they treat the kid right and everything, but, but you can also see how this system could go horribly wrong where you know, people might come over to the U.S. without any means to support a kid and have a baby just for the purpose of doing this. And that could lead to a lot of problems for that kid later on in life. Yeah, I mean, all of this makes the point we kind of made in the last episode that if you want to have a society of the rule of law and where everybody is kind of under the same legal umbrella then make immigration easy. I mean, make it easy for people to come here and to get into the system so that if you think they should be paying taxes and all this other stuff, then make it possible for them to do that. Another issue that's become prominent, at least in the U.S. recently, is same-sex marriage. This is probably a situation where making same-sex marriage illegal can be most hurtful to people because even if you're a heterosexual couple from different countries, just trying to find one place where you can both be together without being harassed by anyone isn't very easy. Now, if you're a same-sex couple and you're in a country that doesn't recognize same-sex marriage and therefore they wouldn't issue you a spouse visa or anything like that, then you're in a lot of trouble. I mean, really, your only choice if you want to be together is to find somewhere else that will recognize your marriage and that will accept both of you as either citizens or, or residents. So this highlights, I think, a, a misconception that people have about what the problem is with disallowing same-sex marriage. It's not that they're not letting you get married. So Australia officially doesn't support same-sex marriage right now. Yet I know a couple of guys who got married in Sydney. So they just had a private justice of the peace or someone who officiated their wedding. They had a beautiful wedding in Sydney. But of course, the fact that they've married each other and made this commitment to each other isn't recognized by the Australian government. Now, where this becomes a problem is the fact that the government has certain policies that are based on granting privileges to people who are married. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the U.S., there's tax benefits. If your spouse is filing jointly, you can increase your deductions and, and reduce the amount of tax that you have to pay. So really, the problem here is that government has certain policies in place that put burdens on people based on their marital status and that the government is only willing to recognize certain forms of marriage. I think probably the libertarian position here is that government needs to get out of marriage altogether and allow it to be recognized privately by individuals. And a lot of people see this as being some sort of homophobia or something like that, but they're really not comprehending the actual argument there. What this libertarian argument is, is that these sort of alternative marriage arrangements, and this could be, you know, same-sex marriage, could be even polygamy or something like that. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> whatever you're into. Um, essentially, it's live and let live. It all comes back to the whole non-aggression principle thing, where if you're not hurting anybody else, then you're free to do what you want. So in a nutshell, the way I see it is that government needs to be out of the marriage business, but it also needs to be out of the harassing people business. Maybe it just needs to be out of business altogether. Another issue with restrictions on immigration and citizenship, it's probably possible to have situations where you end up with people who are essentially stateless. So if you have a kid who's born in a country that only grants citizenship based on the parent's citizenship, but if the parents aren't citizens and their native country only grants based on birth in the country, then essentially you could have a kid who's a citizen of nowhere. <laughs> and depending on the country, there may be ways to deal with that. And, now, you know, a lot of countries, like a lot of poor countries around the world, it probably doesn't matter if you're a citizen or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, another way this could happen, too, is simply if there's a poor country that just doesn't keep great records, or if you have people living in a, say, a remote village or something like that, living in traditional ways or something where they just don't do birth certificates. Right, or places that are war-torn where all the records get destroyed. And Right, yeah. Probably the best-known ethnic group who lives like this would be gypsies in throughout Eastern Europe and kind of Western Asia, who have essentially just always lived outside the system, have never filed birth certificates for any of their kids and that sort of thing, uh, have never really lived in a permanent place. They're essentially these stateless people who just kind of wander from one place to the next. And as a result, that kind of way of life they end up being excluded from 
everything else in society, really. Not necessarily because they're not citizens. There's probably other social elements to that as well. But they're living arguably a lower quality of life with less access to, to all the resources that society has to offer, partly because they're simply not part of the system. Yeah, and some of those things, it's not just like that they don't have access to, you know, government schooling and government health care and all that stuff. But I mean, even just having property rights and, you know, being able to own property and have those property rights be protected. Right. And when they're outside the system, it's probably a lot harder for them to do that, which means that then they can't build capital and really improve their economic well-being just yeah. because they've chosen you know, not to fill out the paperwork. Yeah. And another example is the, the Tom Hanks movie, The Terminal, where he's, I think, <laughs> I haven't actually seen it, but my understanding is while he's on an overnight flight, when, when he lands in the U.S., He's trying to go through customs, and it turns out that his country's government was dissolved overnight while he was on the plane. Right. <laughs> and so he gets to LAX or wherever it is, and they won't let him in because his passport's no longer valid. Right. And of course, he can't go back because there's no one left to take him back at his own country, so he ends up being stuck in the terminal. Now, of course, it's <laughs> a, a fictional and, and probably kind of ridiculous example <laughs> of the sort of thing that could happen, but it, I guess it does illustrate pretty clearly what it's like to be a stateless person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wasn't Edward Snowden bouncing around between a few different airports before he finally got someone to take him in? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's kind of like I was saying with the same-sex marriage issue here, is that the problem isn't that these people are stateless. The problem is that everywhere they go is ruled by a state. That means that there's going to be laws in place, especially laws related to immigration or paperwork or anything like that, that's going to affect these people. Because the way these states operate is that if you're not part of the game playing for some other state that your state is friends with, then they're going to give you a hard time about it. It comes back to this whole presumption of guilt as opposed to the presumption of innocence where anybody from outside the country you know, is presumed to be a threat or bad in some way. So if you have people who haven't been blessed by their own government, <laughs> then they're going to have a hard time going in and out of different countries. Or if, again, if they do go in and out of those different countries, they're going to continue to live outside the system, which a lot of people see as problematic. Another unintended consequence of immigration controls, and this relates to border controls, is the fact that you have people who are willing to risk their lives in order to cross the border to live somewhere illegally. So that creates incentives for this industry of human trafficking, where you have people taking risks to escort other people across the border and possibly make arrangements to get them somewhere within the country. The problem here is that because of the risk and illegality of it, the people who are willing to provide this service tend to be pretty dangerous people. Yeah, and this opens up opportunities for even more unsavory people to take advantage of these immigrants who are willing to risk or pay anything just to get across the border. And so you hear all these stories about people being abused or robbed or kidnapped or possibly even murdered. And of course, this colors the image that people have of what human traffickers are. They're just these criminals who are preying on these poor, innocent people who are just trying to get across the border. But of course, the whole reason these industries exist is because of the enforcement on the borders in the first place. So without these immigration or travel restrictions, these people who are so desperate to leave one place and go to another place would have a much easier time and probably a lot more legitimate options and safer options for getting there. Yeah, this is the age-old prohibition argument, where in the 1920s, in the United States, alcohol was made illegal. And so you had all of this criminality rising up around alcohol. You had rum runners and bathtub gin and speakeasies and Al Capone. <laughs> this entire industry of criminality was given birth around the industry of providing alcohol to people. Of course, we see the same thing today with drug trafficking. Anytime you take something that's in high demand and prohibit it and make it illegal, it creates a profit center for criminal organizations who are willing to break the law to earn a lot of money by providing something that even normal people might want. Yeah, and one irony of this is that during Prohibition, they actually had some of these gangsters and prohibitionists both arguing against legalizing alcohol because for the prohibitionists, obviously, they had their, their moral concerns or whatever. Of course, the gangsters knew exactly why they were making so much money and who was protecting their markets for them. Right. And as we said, this is true of alcohol, drugs, gambling, even something like prostitution. And the same thing applies to immigration as we're discussing it. That when you make immigration illegal, you create a profit center for unsavory people to escort people across the border. And like with prohibition of alcohol, during that period, 
is when mixed drinks became popular because it was a lot easier for someone to sneak a bottle of gin in their pants pocket and then they could make a lot of drinks out of that and sell it to different people. It's a little bit analogous with human trafficking where since let's say each boat coming to Australia is taking a certain risk and if the guy driving the boat gets caught he's going to face the same penalty regardless of how many people are on the boat then he actually has an incentive to cram as many people onto that boat as possible. And so when you hear about these horrible conditions that these people have in these boats, and and there's been quite a few, probably three or four times a year, there's a big news story about there was a boat full of illegal immigrants that sank and everybody died or something like that. And these things do happen. And and of course, it's a horrible situation. But to blame these human traffickers, certainly they're not doing the right thing. However, it's not the root cause of the problem. These guys are just responding to an economic incentive that's been created by the government policy of immigration restriction. And it could even be argued that these guys are providing a legitimate service to these people. And the fact that they're willing to take a risk, (laughs) if you look at it in a certain way, the ones that are actually honest, (laughs) if there are any, could be considered almost heroes of some kind. Yeah, part of the problem in this immigration industry, just like with the drugs and formerly alcohol, is that the people engaging with each other in this industry have no access to a justice system to enforce any kind of a contract or agreement between them. So similar to the stateless people, once these immigrants break the law and try to get into a country, they don't have access to the government's monopolized justice system because they've chosen to live outside of that system. So when these immigrants engage with human traffickers, if something goes wrong, they can't take them to court. And for the traffickers, if something goes wrong, they're going to want to minimize their risk, which means potentially getting rid of the people who were dealing with them. So because these people are forced to be outside of the system, Without access to a justice system, street justice takes its place. Again, we see the same thing with the drug war, with things like gambling, you know, the mafia and gambling, prostitution, is that when all of these things are prohibited, it guarantees that you'll have violence as a means of resolving conflict within those industries. And, you know, I think some people's impression of libertarianism is that it's libertinism, where, you know, anything goes that we just want to make drugs and prostitution legal. <laughs> And to some extent, that's true, but it's not that we think everybody should be doing drugs and hiring prostitutes. It's that we recognize the negative outcomes from the policies of prohibition in these industries, which has nothing to do with drugs or the prostitutes themselves, or has a little bit to do with it, but it has everything to do with trying to eliminate the violence that currently surrounds these industries, and again, eliminating these profit centers for violent people. We talked earlier about, you know, this FinCEN and and FBAR and all this stuff trying to eliminate sources of funding for terrorists. Guess what the biggest source of funding for terrorists is? It's drug money that's funneled down through all these organizations to Afghanistan or wherever else because drugs are illegal. So if you allow drugs to be illegal, even immigration, it starts to remove this profit potential from organized crime really around the world. That would have a much bigger impact than, you know, trying to get terrorists to fill out paperwork and mail it into the U.S. government. In Australia, the issue of immigration is always a hot-button topic, especially around any election time. And they've got a policy here of mandatory detention of anyone who is trying to get into the country who hasn't already got a valid visa. So this could mean a typical, what you'd consider an illegal immigrant, who might be trying to come across for work or something like that. But it also extends to asylum seekers, you know, so people who are refugees from some war zone or something like that, who are seeking asylum in Australia. These two groups of people get treated the same way, which is that they send them off to some island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Nauru. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and they have this detention center, prison island that they've built there. I thought Australia was a prison island. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It was, I mean, it's ironic, isn't it? You know, Australia was founded as a prison island, and now it's got its own little prison island. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, if you're going to take a bunch of people and put them into a concentrated area with fences around it and stuff. Maybe don't call it the Pacific Solution. Seriously? (laughs) That's one of those things where you think like there's some meeting at some point in the process where they're developing this thing, where one person stands up and says, hey guys, you know know what this kind of sounds like? (laughs) (laughs) So one interesting thing about this is that this policy came into effect under the Keating government, which was like, I guess, the Bill Clinton of Australia. So he was a Labour Party prime minister, which is like the Democrats in the U.S. This is one of those things where the left really has no ground to stand on when they start criticizing other immigration policies, because it was their guy that started it. (laughs) Yeah. Now, within this policy, it's not only that they have this mandatory detention, there is some sort of system by which people can get processed and 
eventually either get into Australia or get deported to somewhere else, either back to their home country, or there's a policy where they can actually have indefinite detention of somebody if they're a stateless person. So like we just talked about, this is one of those things where if you're a stateless person, once you get into the clutches of one of the states, then they won't let you back out (laughs) because where are they going to send you? You know, they're going to just let you go back on a boat somewhere to some other country. And then, then you become that other country's problem, I guess is probably the way they think about it. (laughs) It's just mind boggling that they could treat somebody like this. What possible choice do these people have? You're going to take these people, put them in this prison island, whatever it is. Now, the Australian taxpayers are presumably still supporting these people, right? I mean, because obviously they'd be fed somehow. There'd be some sort of medical facility there. I mean, I'm sure it's pretty substandard, whatever they've got there. And there have been a lot of protests and stuff that you know, every now and then in the news, you see something about a big hunger strike or protest or something that happens at one of these detention camps. Uh-huh. And there are some onshore ones in Australia as well, but there has been a push to push more of them offshore because they say that it discourages you know, more people from coming on boats. Uh-huh. And so the thing is, if the Australian taxpayer is already supporting these people in these camps, not to mention supporting guards and staff for the camps and everything to look after these people, make sure they don't escape, plus all the infrastructure of processing these people to get them their visas and all that. Right. Why not just let them in? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're effectively, <laughs> right. you're paying for the welfare anyways. Why not just let them in? If you're going to give them the welfare, let them in, give them the welfare and give them a chance to get a job and, and get out of the welfare. Well, you know, Australia is in a very big place. I don't know where they would go. Yeah, yeah. We're very space constrained here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> When you consider that Australia has as many people in the entire country, which is about geographically, it's about the size of the U.S., and there's as many people in that whole country as there are in one city in China. And I'm not talking just Beijing. I'm talking pretty much any of these big cities they've got in China. And I think there are about 22 million people in Australia at the moment, or 24, or something like that. (laughs) It's certainly not for lack of space. Right. We can go over the whole laundry list of other objections that people have to immigrants, but we've kind of covered a lot of that already, so... Essentially, whatever you hear about it in the U.S. or anywhere else, people make the same arguments here, which are mostly unsubstantiated. Right. And like you said, I mean, any arguments about the costs of supporting new immigrants coming into the country, I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, but you'd have to weigh those against the huge costs of defending this border, not against invaders of some sort, but against normal people who are just trying to come from one place to another, trying to get a job or to escape poor conditions in their own country. So any argument suggesting that these people are going to be a burden on taxpayers needs to be weighed against the actual costs of enforcing border controls and maintaining things like fences and walls and all that stuff. To answer your question about how many people are actually detained in this program, take a guess. What what number do you think? How many people are detained like at any one time? Yeah. You said there's 20 million people in Australia? Yeah. All right. I'm going to guess 20,000. We're only off by about a factor of three or four. In which direction? (laughs) And that doesn't mean that there's 80,000. What it means is there's less than 6,000 people who are detained in these camps. (laughs) So can you imagine all this discussion and hand-wringing over these, you know, 6,000 people? And now granted, that's that's a number of people at any one time. So there are people that flow through that system. When you actually understand the numbers that are involved... It just sounds ridiculous that they'd maintain this whole infrastructure and process and have all this legislation and court trials and all this stuff to try to prosecute these people. And so this is one area where these immigration policies have a very definite effect on the built environment, at least in places like Nauru, where essentially they take a pristine, beautiful Pacific island, turn it into a bloody prison. As a result of the Syrian refugee crisis, which we discussed on episode 6, there's been a massive influx of people from, mainly from Syria, into Europe. And what's happened over the past year or so since these people have been living in these countries, we've been seeing a lot of news stories about crimes being committed by these immigrants, including things like robberies, sexual harassment, even rape, and possibly even murders. Now, this is obviously a problem. An interesting consequence of all this is that it has strengthened a lot of these ultra-nationalist or what you might call a far-right and even maybe neo-Nazi groups who previously existed in the countries but really had very little influence and were pretty well marginalized. But now that there are these influxes of foreign immigrants, these sort of groups are gaining a lot of support because they're very vocal in their opposition to these immigrants who they see as being the source of all these crime problems. And the way that these far-right groups are gaining so much support is that there might be a group of these immigrants who hang around some public space like a train station or a park or something like that, 
and supposedly they're harassing women as they're walking by and even kidnapping or raping women. And so for whatever reason, there's a perception that the local police in these places simply aren't going after the criminals who are among these immigrants. And as a result, these far-right groups are stepping in as vigilantes and starting to go down to these train stations with baseball bats and whatever else. I don't know if they play baseball in Sweden with weapons and starting to privately police these public spaces to prevent these immigrants from hanging around and becoming a threat. Now, I'm not really clear on what scale these crimes are actually happening at. My gut feeling is that it's probably something that's a bit overblown in the media, where it's a, a very noticeable crime that relates to a lot of irrational fears that people have in general of these immigrants who come from a different culture, especially if it's an Islamic culture, which a lot of people perceive to be misogynistic and disrespecting towards women. And so these far-right groups are painting themselves as sort of the heroes who are protecting their nation's women or whatever. As a result, they're actually gaining support. Now, for all my leftist friends on Facebook who, who like to post memes about how great Sweden is, it's worth noting that this is something that's happening there, where you have some neo-Nazi groups who are gaining support. And, and even in Poland, I think the government is predominantly this nationalist group now. So again here, it's this perverse consequence of these policies of socialized public spaces as well as socialized police forces where there's no real entity that can be held accountable for what happens in these public spaces. And if some crime goes unpunished, the cops don't pay a price for that. They simply move on to the next crime or whatever. The police are stretched thin and they're losing control over these public spaces. I haven't been following this as closely as you have, but I would imagine that there's probably some concern about the police mistreating all of these immigrants. So where you have people who are supporting the immigrants in this country... I imagine that the police are probably sensitive to accusations about kind of mistreating these refugees or, you know, acting in the way that these neo-Nazi rightist groups are acting and persecuting them. If that's the case, I would imagine that that would make the police somewhat hesitant to aggressively police these populations. Yeah, it's the sort of thing I think where there's, depending on who you ask, you'll get a different story. If you ask someone who's more of a, a right-leaning person, at least in this European sense of, of right being nationalist-leaning person, they'll probably tell you that the cops won't go after these people because they're trying to be politically correct and they don't want to come off as racist or whatever. <laughs> but there's probably other people within the immigrant communities or who are probably more on the left side of the political spectrum who could probably find examples of where cops are being disproportionately rough with these people and, and overly zealous in prosecuting them. It's a typical sort of thing that when there's no accountability and everyone's expecting these noble cops to always do the right thing, when the right thing isn't done, it's going to look like it's the cops that screwed it up one way or the other. Yeah, and as we said in the last episode, you know, there's nothing remarkable about these immigrant groups in terms of their propensity for criminality and violence. These are really just poor people, often homeless, with no access to jobs or other means of supporting themselves. So the kind of criminality you see is typical of other groups already within the country who suffer from conditions of poverty, homelessness, and lack of services. And so it's interesting because these far-right groups in these countries, they're not far-right in terms of economics. That is, they're far from the sort of people who want free markets. In fact, in a place like Sweden, they're just as much in support of the welfare state as their opponents on, I guess, the left. So the thing to note is that these far-right groups, they're really only to the far-right on this issue of nationalism or racism or immigration. But economically, they're all socialists. I think one way to look at this is that I guess what you'd call the leftists in these countries are inclusionary socialists, where they want to allow these immigrants into the country and bestow upon them all the benefits that the citizens of the country already receive. Whereas these far-right groups could be considered exclusionary socialists. They see it as sort of a zero-sum game where there's only so much welfare to go around and the more people that come into the country, then that's going to dilute the resources that are available to the people who are already in the country. Of course, the fundamental problem here is that socialism is unsustainable, regardless of whether it's a national socialism or an international socialism. So as Joe said, the people on the left are promoting more of a global international socialism where everybody is brought under the same socialist umbrella, whereas these socialists on the right are promoting national socialism which is to have the socialist welfare state within their own country. And of course, a lot of people forget that Nazism was explicitly a form of socialism, that is, national socialism, which is what these far-right groups are promoting. I think one reason why Nazism is so universally reviled, and rightly so, at least within the framework of American politics, we have the American left who disavows Nazism primarily because of the nationalistic or racist side of it, and the American right, which disavows it because of the socialist side of it. But really, these are two sides of the same coin, and that coin is simply statism. 
So when it comes down to it, the leftists are deluded in thinking that socialism is sustainable, but the nationalists are deluded in thinking that they can try to save it. In the last episode, we mentioned some of the effects that immigration has on the built environment, and we want to dig into that a little more deeply in this episode. As we mentioned in the last episode, one thing you often see with immigrants especially mass immigration from a particular place, is that you have immigrant communities that can develop within cities and certain areas of the nation that they're immigrating to. I mentioned the Molenbeek area of Brussels, where a lot of Muslims have immigrated to, and which has become a a kind of insular community of Muslims within Europe. And we discussed some of the problems with that, how because immigration is illegal, that they may tend to protect people within their community and not cooperate with local police and local law enforcement and not participate or assimilate more broadly within the local community. But there are certainly other examples of immigrant communities like this that haven't seen maybe some of the same problems that we're currently seeing in areas like Molenbeek. For example, if you go to any major city in the United States, there's usually a Chinatown. (laughs) And it's a place where you can go where you see signs in Chinese. There's lots of restaurants. You can go and get some of the best dim sum in town. and, (laughs) And there's maybe outdoor cultural markets. And it becomes this kind of quaint experience for people in that city where they can go and get a a real authentic taste of this other culture without getting on a plane. And of course, this has benefits of breaking down the perceptions or maybe misperceptions that people have about foreigners coming into their country. And so a lot of cities have areas which are well known as certain ethnic enclaves. For example, in Boston, we've got the North End, which is also known as Little Italy, where you've got lots of Italian restaurants and, of course, Mike's Pastries. Or cannolis. In some other areas, you might get some more distinctive groups. For example, there could be a Korea town out in L.A. There's an enclave of Armenian people, as well as up around the California Bay Area. There's a lot of Afghani people that live around there. And another one that we've touched on earlier in the episode is the Barossa Valley, just near Adelaide, South Australia, which is a pretty well-known wine country. The Barossa Valley was founded by German immigrants I think around the turn of the century. And so there's, there's a few little towns up in the Adelaide Hills and Barossa Valley that have traditional German architecture and some of the, some churches and houses and things like that. So, And of course, being Germans living in Australia, there's more than a few beer halls you can go visit. Yeah, it may sound a little silly to say that we should open up the borders so that we could have better restaurants in our city <laughs> and better beer gardens. Isn't that reason enough? <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, I think there is some some real benefit there to exposing people to the culture as well as to allowing those cultures to open themselves up to the population where they're arriving. I think one of the best examples of this is in Boston around the turn of the 20th century, you had a huge wave of Irish immigrants coming into Boston. And at the time, they were just as reviled as some other immigrant groups are today coming into even the United States. But they formed a strong community within the city. And in fact, St. Patrick's Day, at least within the United States, was invented by the Irish Cultural Center in Boston. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) So anybody who's slogging down a green beer on March 17th (laughs) shouldn't have any problem with allowing immigration into the country. (laughs) So the point of all this is to say that I think that there is value in allowing these immigrant communities to develop and to be somewhat insular from the surrounding community. I don't think that complete assimilation is necessary or even desirable for the health and vitality of the broader community within a region. Yeah, I think it's important to make a distinction between integration and assimilation, where assimilation means that the people are fully adopting the existing culture of the place that they're moving to, whereas integration means that they're preserving their own culture, but interacting with the people who are already there in mutually beneficial ways. And in general, after two or three generations of these people living in a particular place, Their kids will most likely be going to school with the kids who are already in the country, as well as getting all the TV shows and everything else that everyone else in the country is getting. So generally, it only takes maybe two or three generations before these communities are either assimilated or well integrated into their new place. There's another goofy Australian movie that was made, I think, in the 60s or 70s sometime, which is about an Italian immigrant who comes to Australia, and it follows him around as he assimilates into Australian culture. It's probably a little bit like a proto-Borat, where he comes to the country and he's just kind of, you know, fresh off the boat, doesn't really know his way around or anything. And (laughs) (laughs) I think he even encounters some racism. And they had some derogatory names for Italians back then. I can't remember what they are in the Australian parlance. So he starts out where he's facing these sorts of cultural challenges. 
And then eventually he gets a job, starts working with some Aussie guys, you know, and they give him a hard time, but they realize that he's a hard worker and he kind of proves his worth. You know, they, they take him down to the pub and the, the pub tries to throw him out because he's Italian. Of course, his Aussie buddies back him up. And, and of course, by the end of the movie, he's basically fully assimilated, full on Aussie. <laughs> I think the climax of the movie is when he's sitting with some Italian friends of his. I think he suddenly jumps up and just says, let's get pissed, <laughs> and, and runs out to try to find a keg of beer. <laughs> so, so by then, he was full-on Aussie. Yeah, there was another movie like that about an Australian who came to New York City <laughs> and tried to assimilate with the local culture there and faced some similar challenges. <laughs> and just as a counterpoint to that, there's a guy I know whose mother-in-law is Italian. She's been living in Australia since like the 1950s. Never learned a word of English. <laughs> <laughs> she had her local Italian shops that she'd go down to and would ride buses around town and everything. But yeah, never actually learned English after being here wow. for, what, 50 years or something like that. Well, arguably, the Australians haven't actually learned English either. When we talk about these cultural enclaves within a bigger city or broader community, as we've said, there can be some benefits to that broader community and having exposure to that kind of diversity. But the real benefit of these cultural enclaves is the development of a cultural support network for communities of immigrants who have arrived and who continue to arrive so that when people come from foreign places into a culture that is completely unfamiliar to them, that they have resources they can tap into and they have a network of services and of people who can help them to get on their feet and to adjust to life within that new community. So, for example, within that community, they might have access to credit, to insurance, to job placement, education and language learning, transportation, and possibly even barter, where they can find ways to kind of get their foot in the door in the economy and start to become productive members of the society. When Joe talked about some of the issues of the Syrian and other refugees coming to Europe and living in public places and creating problems... Well, in these places where you have these cultural enclaves, they're much better equipped to absorb these immigrant communities without even relying on the public sector and government welfare, where they can come and have some familiarity and have people who are willing to help them and to assist them because they've been through the same experience and they see value in helping people from their own culture. The situation could arise where people immigrating have a culture that conflicts with the norms and values in their new country. So, for example, with a lot of the recent immigration of Islamic people to Western countries, we hear a lot of complaints about mistreatment of women within the Islamic culture. Now, without taking a position on whether or not that's actually happening, because we don't really want to get into all that here, let's just assume that it is and have a look at how you might resolve this sort of inherent conflict between the two cultures who are now living in the same area. So the question that needs to be asked is, is it right for the established people who have already been in the community for a long time to try to fix the culture of the immigrants once they arrive in the country? In other words, is forced assimilation a legitimate course of action? Now, obviously, this forced assimilation doesn't sound like a very anarchic approach to the situation, with the exception of particular circumstances. For example, we discussed what's happening in Sweden, where you're getting these neo-Nazi groups who are harassing some of these migrants and, you could argue, trying to force them to assimilate through violent means. Now, this obviously isn't an anarchic solution, even though it's not the actual government who's doing it. And I think what makes the difference there, unless there's a case where these guys are defending someone against an actual crime being committed, as opposed to some general suspicion that a crime would be committed by a group of people standing around, then there's really no justification for their use of violence. In fact, in that case, they are the ones who are initiating the violence. So when you look at things this way, the next question you need to ask is whether there is a nonviolent solution or an anarchic solution to allow people who are unhappy within this culture to escape it and move themselves into the broader culture. <laughs> and I think the way I ask the question answers itself. <laughs> the solution is simply to allow people who are unhappy within their immigrant enclave to find a new place to live elsewhere in the culture, or you allow them to have the same protections that anyone else would have against, let's say, domestic violence. So really, there's nothing too intractable here. If anything, it's the established people in the country who have to come to terms with the fact that there are people living amongst them who do have a different set of cultural norms and morals, which they might not be able to so-called fix with any violent or government means. It's worth re-emphasizing, you mentioned this, but I think we need to make it a stronger point, that any aspects of this culture that rely on governmental means or the initiation of force for their enforcement within the culture 
could justify the use of force by someone trying to protect the victims of that policy. So, for example, if women have no recourse within their own culture against domestic violence, then they would have access to legal resources within the broader community in order to protect themselves and seek justice for the way that they've been mistreated. I think that when you allow these subcultures to exist within some broader anarchic culture, that over time you're going to see the more egregious and especially the violent or aggressive aspects of that culture dissipate a bit. Because when people within that culture have access to alternative ways of life that could be more beneficial or advantageous to them, then some of them may choose to either leave or try to reform their own culture within that area to try to make it more open and tolerant. And this is something that's very hard to do when you have these cultures living within a state structure in their own country somewhere in the world where they don't have access to alternative cultures and legal systems that recognize the initiation of force as wrong. So it can be difficult to reform inhumane legal practices within a state system. But when that culture is allowed to exist in an anarchic system, or even just a less oppressive state system, it creates opportunities for people within that culture to question and reform the more oppressive aspects of their culture. For a more in-depth discussion of what we mean when we use the term aggression, you can go back to episode two, where we define what a government is and how it uses aggression. When cultural enclaves form within cities or areas of a culture different than their own, one thing we start to see happening within the built environment is a replication of elements of their own culture. So we gave the obvious example of something like a Chinatown, where you start to see lots of authentic Chinese restaurants popping up within the neighborhood. But beyond that, there are most likely many other types of businesses being developed that may reflect their way of doing business in their home country. For example, in many, especially poorer countries, it's not uncommon to see kind of impromptu businesses popping up on the sidewalks and in public places and possibly even within buildings or like out in front of the grocery store where you might see individuals setting up very small businesses to sell things to other people within their community. So, for example, when my family was traveling in Panama, when we went into the grocery store, which was a kind of American style modern grocery store, Out front, you would have a number of people who would set up little tables or booths where they would be selling all kinds of things. There could be guys selling fish or a number of people were selling what I think were lottery tickets (laughs) or even just fruit and vegetables. These people would literally set up in the grocery store parking lot, which you'd think that the grocery store wouldn't want (laughs) to have these people coming in and buying their fish instead of the fish in the grocery store. But everybody seemed to be okay with it. It's probably the kind of thing where you get four car dealerships popping up right next door to each other on the same street where you know people will come to get the fresh fish from the fish guy, but they'll still go into the shop to buy their breakfast cereal or whatever. I guess so, yeah. I, mean, I don't think any of this was formal in, in any way where the, you know, I don't think the fish guy was going into the grocery store and asking them if he could sit on his bucket out front and, <laughs> and sell his fish. <laughs> but they weren't like calling the cops on him or anything. They were allowing it to happen. Right, it's just accepted there. And this, I think this is a very important way that people, especially in poor cultures, can support themselves is by finding some little service that they can provide within their community in order to provide goods and generate some income for themselves. Yeah, when I was doing some work in Beijing, there was this guy who I'd walk by every morning, and he had a little cart that he'd set up on the sidewalk, and he'd sit right out there on the sidewalk and repair people's bikes. He had a little bike repair shop going, just out of some little trailer or something that he carried around. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. that's probably a big business in China. (laughs) Yeah, he seemed to always have business. (laughs) When we were in Puerto Rico... In Puerto Rico, at least where we were, isn't quite as impoverished as some of the areas in Panama and later the Dominican Republic that we went to. But across the street from where we stayed was a big kind of empty parking lot that was part of a park and a playground. And there was a guy there who just had this kind of canopy with four poles. And he pulled up in his van. He had a generator, he had a compressor, and he had a power washer. And he just set himself up as a car wash in the middle of this parking lot. (laughs) (laughs) And he had a lot of business. Every day people were coming through and washing their cars. Yeah, right. And the best part was that he had a friend who would show up and bring a folding chair and a pair of scissors and give people haircuts while they were getting the car washed. (laughs) (laughs) That's synergy. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) So I came to think about all these kinds of impromptu business activities as what I'm going to call sidewalk entrepreneurship, where you have people utilizing some small piece of public space in order to generate economic activity. Yeah, and this is something that you see all throughout Southeast Asia, Latin America, I imagine Africa, although I haven't been there, and probably the Middle East as well, where, for example, in Bangkok, 
sidewalk eateries are very popular where some guy will just have a little frying pan set up on a propane hot plate with a few tables out in front and be making some sort of noodles or pad thai or something like that for people. And it's great. The food's fantastic. The service is usually pretty quick. It's dirt cheap. And it's it's just win-win for everybody. Except for the food poisoning you got. (laughs) (laughs) Those were more established restaurants. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and you just said something important, which is that by allowing these low-cost businesses to exist, they're able to, for one thing, generate income for themselves and also provide low-cost services to the community. So when you have these poorer communities, some people might not be able to afford to go in and buy shrimp at the American-style grocery store but they might be able to afford it from the guy who's sitting on his five-gallon bucket out in front of the store. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Holding the shrimp up in the air for all the passersby. Yeah, and a recent trend in Western countries has been the explosion in the number of lunch trucks and food trucks and that sort of thing that are popping up all over the place. And it's a similar sort of thing where these lunch trucks probably can get around some of the regulations that fixed restaurants have to deal with. They can keep their overheads dirt low and sell affordable food and good quality food to a lot of people all over the place. Yeah, it's not just the cost of regulation that they're saving on. I mean, obviously, by not having to own or rent real estate, they're saving significant costs compared to a bricks and mortar restaurant. And beyond that, some of these businesses don't even need a place to stand. When we were in the Dominican Republic, whenever we were out on the beach, there would be a number of people who would come by offering up all kinds of things. So you'd have some guy come by wearing like a sandwich board that's filled with sunglasses or little toy trinkets for the kids <laughs> or other kind of souvenir. We were in an area that was pretty touristy along the beach, but still had a lot of the authentic culture of the local area. Whenever you're on the beach, these guys would come by and offer you whatever souvenir du jour they had. <laughs> <laughs> They'd even come by selling things like DVDs. <laughs> this one guy every day would come by and try to sell me a copy of Kung Fu Panda 3. <laughs> <laughs> so did you buy it? No, I hadn't seen the first two, so I figured I'd be lost. (laughs) You get lost in all the intricacies of the plot? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Plus, it was probably in Spanish. As some other examples of this, there was one guy who came by every day with his son, I assume it was his son, selling coconuts. And this guy was actually blind. And so his son was guiding him around the beach. And whenever he heard someone's voice, he'd kind of turn and come up to them and uh, started pitching his coconuts. And he also had some coconut oil that I, I don't know if he made or whatever, but that he was selling with the coconuts. And he would come up to you and shake your hand and kind of grab your hand and pull out your arm and dump some coconut oil on it so you could yeah. <laughs> feel the coconut oil. And if you saw you had, or not saw, but if you heard you had kids, he would start to pull out coconuts to cut up the coconuts for the kids to drink. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which we did a few times because the kids liked the coconuts, but right. we didn't need it every day. <laughs> yeah. But he was a pretty shrewd salesman. Yeah. And a nice guy. And it was kind of entertaining watching a blind guy hack a coconut open with a machete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried opening a coconut once in my shed with a hammer and chisel, and I just made a complete disaster out of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely an art to it. You gotta. I think the machete helps. <laughs> Another woman came by frequently carrying a big plastic Tupperware container on her head. And she stopped by us one day and was very quiet. We were sitting at a table at an outside bar. And she sat down and opened up her Tupperware. And inside it was all this fantastic looking granola, like these nut bars. And I thought you were going to say she had a Tupperware thing full of Tupperware that she was trying to sell. <laughs> <laughs> no, that we would have bought. <laughs> so she had all this amazing looking granola. And so we bought a handful of it. And it was made with like real nuts and I think molasses or maybe honey and coconut. And so she had all different kinds of these little bars and kind of wafers. <laughs> so we bought a handful of these and took them home and gobbled them up. And then every day after that, whenever we saw her on the beach, <laughs> for one thing, we, we started bringing cash with us to the beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because every day we saw her, we would flag her. I would literally, my wife would be like sitting up with the kids and I'd be in the water. And I'd yell, granola! <laughs> She's coming down the street. And my wife would run up with the cash to get ready to buy some more. We found out later on that this woman walks that beach 12 to 14 hours a day, just going back and forth, back and forth along the few miles of this beach. Jeez. Selling her granola bars to people. And then, of course, she makes the granola bars herself, I guess, at night when she goes home. Man. We also found out that she was a widow and mother of six children. Jeez. So this was how she was supporting herself and her whole family was by making this granola and walking the beach and selling it to tourists and locals like us. We talked about it with one of our taxi drivers and he was was saying how much he liked it as well. (laughs) 
So here's somebody who's found kind of a unique service that she can provide within that community. We didn't see anybody else selling a product quite like hers. There were plenty of guys selling the trinkets and souvenirs and Kung Fu Panda 3. Yeah. But she really identified a service that she could provide within that community and found a very low cost way to set herself up as a business. When we talk about immigrant communities, I think it's important to recognize how these people are getting by within their native land and to allow some of these entrepreneurial strategies to exist and to flourish, especially within their own cultural enclave. Another example of this from the Dominican Republic is something called moto conchos, which are really just taxis, but it's not just any taxi. It's a guy on a motorcycle (laughs) who's driving by. And if you're walking on the sidewalk, he'll flag you down and ask if you want to ride. And this is how people get around in the Dominican Republic is they'll just hop on the back of a moto concho and it's like, you know, a buck to ride across town on this thing. And all day long, these guys drive around in circles just looking for people to pick up. So it's, it's really just a simplified version of a taxi driver, but they're not licensed or anything. It's just become a, a cultural norm there that anybody with a motorcycle can offer a ride to somebody else and ask them for a couple of bucks. And that's what people do. It's like the Uber of driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although with Uber, I'm guessing that there aren't too many people who are going to pull up in their motorcycle and have your wife hop on the back with her infant in a carrier, her son on her lap, and then you hop on the handlebars to drive around town. <laughs> That's what they're doing down there. That must be Uber X. <laughs> <laughs> that might be like Uber question mark. When we think about what this kind of sidewalk entrepreneurship means for the built environment, it really shows the importance of public space. And not only that, but allowing public space to be used as a marketplace by anybody who wants to provide a good or or service in their community. And this doesn't just mean like a public plaza or a parking lot or something that on every Saturday might have a farmer's market. This means that really any public area, whether it's a sidewalk or a park or even something like the lobby of a building or a shopping mall or something, could potentially foster these kind of micro-businesses with minimal startup costs. So what does it mean when you talk about public space within an anarchic society? Because then you wouldn't have the government building parks or plazas or whatever, like you said, or sidewalks, I guess. So where would these public spaces come from? In any society, you're going to have public space. And when I say public space, it doesn't necessarily mean that that space is publicly owned. Or Nowadays, we call things public when they're owned by the government and private when they're not owned by the government. But that's really inconsequential. What matters is, is the use of the space. Is the public allowed to use a particular area? or is used restricted to the owners or or some other smaller group of people. I think there's a difference here between calling something private property and private space, or public property and public space. I'd like to explore the nuances of that a little more deeply, maybe in a future episode. But in general, in any society, you're going to have public space. For one thing, every piece of private property needs a public road, or at least a public right-of-way, in order to access the private property. And so roads and rights of way necessarily take on a public character in terms of who is able to access and use them. So when we think about something like a sidewalk, sidewalks can form part of that right of way that allows people to travel from one place to another to access their own property. This all gets a little tricky in terms of how we define it in an anarchic society where technically all the land is owned by somebody. However, another concept that applies here is a concept of homesteading where people establish their private property by establishing the boundaries of that property and establishing the use of that property. I think the same thing is true of these public right-of-ways, where over time, if you have an area of land that's being used by people as a right-of-way or as a corridor for transportation, I think that they can effectively homestead that use, not just for themselves, but as a truly public right-of-way, where even though some individual or organization might own the right-of-way, over time, its use as a public right-of-way has been homesteaded and established so that the owners may not necessarily have the right to exclude anybody they want from that property. They may be able to exclude people under some conditions, like if they're driving dangerously or otherwise endangering people. But I think that in an anarchic society, there is justification for public use of private property in order to provide what we've been talking about in this whole episode, which is freedom of movement. Right, and so once that freedom of movement principle is established... You could have some of these other businesses or public services that pop up that more or less piggyback on that principle of freedom of movement and right of way. And another aspect of this as well is that there could be plenty of privately owned property that functions as a public space, even if it's not 
strictly some sort of a right of way or easement or something like that where anybody can access it. And an example of this would be what we just discussed with the grocery store in, where was it, Panama? Yeah. Where you had a business with their own private parking lot, but they allowed people to come in and set up their own little market stalls there in order to sort of expand the services that were offered at that location. And by doing this, they could draw more people to their shop. I think another way that some privately owned property might open itself up for public use is, as we said, within these cultural enclaves. So if you have a plaza within an area like a Chinatown, the owner might see a benefit in allowing that area to be opened up in order to have the kind of market that's familiar to people within that culture and to assist newcomers in starting their own business. Right, and they might also want to promote their own culture and foster this sense of community within people from their own culture, as well as welcoming people in from the broader culture of of their new country. And in this way, they can achieve that integration that we talked about as opposed to assimilation, where they do preserve their own culture. However, they do interact with and don't isolate themselves from the broader community. What you often see in these cultural enclaves is that the community themselves will get together and whether it's through an organization or just a group of individuals, start to create the kind of community spaces that are meaningful to them. So, for example, in the 19th and 20th century in America, there were immigrants coming from all over Europe, and wherever they settled down, they would get together and build a church. So you might have, you know, Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or Armenian or Italian Catholic, all these different types of churches being built up within communities all around the country. You see that happening now more with with Islamic cultures, where Islamic immigrants moving to new places will get together and try to build a mosque within their community. And often these religious buildings serve multiple functions. Obviously they have their religious function, but they also become that community gathering space that is needed to foster the sense of community within that cultural group. And it doesn't have to be a religious building. One thing you see in a lot of American cities is they'll have something like an Italian-American club, which was originally established as a gathering place for Italians living in the community. Beyond these public kind of spaces, another thing that's important to have within these immigrant communities is housing, and especially low-cost housing for new arrivals who are coming in. There's a stereotype within the United States of some immigrants coming in and having something like 20 people living in a small apartment. And some of these people might rotate through as they're moving in or out of the area, or as they find employment and are able to afford better housing. But as problematic as that kind of living arrangement is, it shows the need for some kind of a co-housing solution even something like a hostel that allows newcomers to come in and get themselves established to move on to more permanent housing. Another aspect that sort of blends the sidewalk entrepreneurship that we discussed previously with this sort of cohabitation concept is that people can set up businesses running out of their home. So a common one might be something like haircutting or a a small little restaurant. And again, this is something that's very common in other parts of the world, just as a standard thing. It's just the way people live. You know, they'll have a kitchen with a few tables out the front, and then they live out the back or upstairs or something like that. It's got a little bedroom. When we were in Portugal, one evening I was walking around the neighborhoods. We had taken the kids down to the river to watch the sunset. And on the way back, we're walking past this kind of row of apartment buildings. And this one building has a store open. And as we're walking by, I look in, and you just see this kind of green light glowing behind the door. Yeah. And as you get closer, you look inside, and it's this small little room. And there's somebody standing there at a little bar. <laughs> with all kinds of bottles of booze behind them, (laughs) and like three people sitting in in folding chairs in the front of this little room. (laughs) It was just this little kind of basement bar that somebody opened up to the street. (laughs) It was just a really cool little example of something that somebody can do to create a business within their home and also create one of these kind of cultural gathering places that we've been talking about. Yeah, you can imagine if a few people on the block got the same idea, they could almost have their own little sort of micro nightclub (laughs) on the sidewalk. (laughs) Yeah with one guy in the middle running his turntables. You know, one thing we haven't said here is that the problem we're seeing is that, especially in the United States, and I'm sure in other developed areas of the world, a lot of the kinds of things we're talking about here, whether it's utilizing public space for micro-businesses or using residences as businesses, a lot of these things are prohibited in some Western countries, whether it's by zoning laws that define what use you can have for your property or for your house or even things like building code that don't allow you to have certain uses without other certain building requirements in places. And some of those have legitimate reasons behind (laughs) You don't want to necessarily have a nightclub in somebody's basement. (laughs) Or licensing where you can't serve and sell food without all the requisite licenses and inspections from the government. Or cut hair. (laughs) Or cut hair, right? (laughs) Without a license. 
or, you know, drive a taxi or anything else. You know, all these things that we're talking about that people do to get by in these poor countries, most of them are prohibited within the United States and other wealthy countries of the world. And so when we talk about allowing these cultural enclaves to establish and support themselves, I think it's important to recognize the way these people are using their built environment and public space and to allow some of these functions to happen as long as they're not harming anybody else. And the irony here is that a lot of the great public spaces within the United States were formed in exactly this way. So, for example, where I live in Boston, there are a lot of nice little Main Street areas where you see these maybe three-story houses or, or apartment buildings that are set back from the road a bit and all kind of packed closely together. But then there's been an addition added on in the front, built out to the sidewalk, that's a commercial space. And you look up the street and all these storefronts were originally just somebody's house. But at one point, somebody started a business there and built out the shop. And as people did that up and down the street, it created the kind of Main Street community that most neighborhoods now are trying to reestablish in some way. <laughs> but when zoning laws came in, people saw commercial uses as somehow threatening to residential uses and started to divide their communities into strictly residential or strictly commercial zones. I think that's really killed the kind of public life and public space of some of these cities. One criticism that we hear a lot as proponents of extreme free markets, as you might call them, is some sort of trickle-down, perks for the rich, screw the poor sort of thing. But what these examples show is that what we're trying to achieve is the opposite of trickle-down, where you're opening up opportunities at the bottom end of the market for a much wider array of people. So it doesn't mean that you have the rich getting richer, and then as the term trickle-down implies that the rich get richer, and then eventually some of that money makes its way to the poor. That's not it at all. It's that the poor people aren't able to enrich in themselves. And who cares if the rich also get rich? <laughs> I don't see the problem with that, really, because it's not a zero-sum game. It's about building capital at all levels of the economy and allowing people to produce a wider array of goods and services more efficiently. Let's just talk a bit more broadly about how government regulations can either intentionally or inadvertently hinder the success of these immigrant enclaves towards achieving the kind of benefits that we've just been discussing. One of the primary issues, as we've discussed a few times now, is the fact that immigration is made illegal to begin with. As we said, that can encourage issues of more general criminality within these immigrant enclaves and create a situation where people don't trust law enforcement and may not reach out to the broader community for fear of having their friends and family within their community be prosecuted. So when we hear about immigrant communities being plagued with criminality, it's important to recognize the role that the prohibition on immigration plays in creating that condition to begin with. Beyond that, there are more specific regulations related to the built environment that can make it a challenge for immigrants and immigrant communities to succeed We've touched on some of these already. One of them is zoning, which often prohibits multiple uses within any single building and sometimes within a whole neighborhood. We talked about the importance of allowing people to start up their own businesses, either out of their home or out of the public spaces around their home. And when you have zoning laws that restrict the uses of property within a given neighborhood, for example, to being just residential, or even if they allow business uses, you know, requiring a lengthy process to get a business use approved, makes it really difficult for the kind of impromptu sidewalk entrepreneurship that we've been talking about, which is something that can empower immigrants to create their own success and eventually become meaningful contributors to their broader community. And, you know, another kind of secondary impact of zoning is that it tends to create a condition of sprawl where you have houses that need to have a certain lot size and front and side setback, so everything gets spread out, and you don't have the kind of pedestrian urban fabric that's often necessary to support sidewalk businesses and small storefronts in people's place of residence. A similar kind of restriction is within the building codes themselves. Building codes also identify certain uses within buildings and in some cases can prohibit things like mercantile and business uses and residential occupancies. Or they could layer on additional requirements such as fire alarms and more restrictive egress and accessibility requirements that can make it difficult for somebody to start operating a business out of their home. Now, in some cases, there are good reasons for this, but that's part of the reason why you see more of this organic entrepreneurship within poor countries that you don't see as often in a place like the United States. One historical example of this having an impact on the built environment, especially as it pertains to immigrants, was the regulation of boarding houses. 
which were very prolific in cities in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But during the Progressive Era, when there were all these concerns about morality and you basically had these kind of militant Protestants running everything, you know, this is the same kind of time that they brought in Prohibition. You had people that were concerned about a family who had daughters or something and that has some strange man living in their house. <laughs> that was maybe one of the sort of cultural reasons behind some of these laws, but then there were other reasons as well. The usual kind of stuff that's used to justify zoning and building codes, you know, regarding beautification of neighborhoods and that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that was around the time when zoning started becoming widespread. Now, this seriously affected immigrants because, as Tim said earlier, especially poor immigrants coming into the country need to have some sort of low-cost living arrangement where they can kind of get on their feet. And boarding houses were a way in which not only immigrants, but young people who were just kind of getting started in their careers, as well as, I guess, other poor people or anyone else who was maybe moving to a different city to find a new job or something like that. It was very common for families to have an extra room in their house that they could hire out to someone like this. And because you had so many different families offering this service, you probably had a wide array of different options that people could choose from. So, of course, there would be different quality of houses and sizes of the rooms and all that, which would have commensurate price differences. In addition, you might have different arrangements such as room and board, where you might have meals with the family that you're living with. So this was a great decentralized solution to accommodating all these additional people that were moving into the country, especially for short-term periods until they could get on their feet. And this also had effects on the design of the houses, where it was very popular to have something like a granny flat, which was a converted shed in the backyard or something like an apartment above the garage. So people would actually consider this when building or buying a house. And as a result, you had extra rooms being built all over the place that could house extra people. And it's a little bit like what you get today with something like Airbnb, where I think you're almost seeing a trend back towards this sort of an arrangement mm -hmm. where people will rent out a room within their house or something like that. You could almost see the similar sort of boarding house arrangements re-evolving despite all the zoning and everything that's been thrown at them. Yeah, what's interesting now is that I think there's starting to be a real backlash against the kind of zoning laws that have developed over the last century, not just from libertarian type folks like us. But any kind of urban planner is concerned about density or sprawl, recognize the disastrous unintended consequences of zoning and its role in creating the kind of sprawl of suburbia. And I think we're going to see some of that start to change over the coming decades. I'm sure they'll still maintain some kind of zoning criteria, but I don't think you're going to have everything chopped up and parceled out into these separate zones and having overly restrictive minimum lot sizes and things like that. I think there's going to be a real effort towards creating a framework for reestablishing density related to zoning and building codes, licensing of specific occupations. One issue with licensing that affects immigrants is that you could have somebody who is completely qualified and even licensed in their own country to provide a service, whether that's something like an electrician or even something like a doctor. But when they come to a new country like the United States, that licensure or certification isn't recognized here. And in most professions, it's a pretty onerous process to go through and get licensed within the United States. So you hear these stories about, you know, someone who's a, a surgeon in India and they come to New York City and he's a taxi driver. <laughs> yeah. So if you hear people complaining that immigrants aren't, you know, doing enough to contribute to society or something like that. Or they're not skilled workers or something. Right. I mean, you have to recognize that in some cases they're literally being prohibited from what they can do best by this myriad of ridiculous licensing requirements for almost every skilled profession you can think of. And similar to licensing, but in a less formal sense, is, is simple bigotry or xenophobia. For example, people who might be hiring for jobs or police patrolling certain neighborhoods. I mean, it's fashionable these days to kind of call everyone a racist if they don't follow a specific set of rules and use all the right words and all that. And that has kind of a backlash effect where the term racism has really lost a lot of the power that it once had. Because for better or worse, it gets thrown around so much that it's almost lost its bite. However, there are still real bigots out there. Now, hopefully in today's world, they don't have a lot of influence or power to affect things throughout society. One way, and really the best way, to overcome the kind of bigotry that is all too common even in today's society is with the market. So when you have economic opportunities opened up to everybody, immigrants and people from all different cultures are able to compete with others for jobs and for customers. And if there is some kind of widespread bigotry within a society you'll start to see that reflected in the prices of labor or in the shopping habits of consumers. And what that means is that it's going to put a price on bigotry. So if you have an employer who doesn't want to hire somebody of a different race, 
you know, they, they might be willing to hire somebody who's less qualified, who's of their preferred race or whatever. But in doing so, they're going to pay a premium for that person over somebody who is more qualified, but doesn't meet their ridiculous racial criteria. So over time, you could have a situation where businesses who are discriminating either have higher costs related to that or have less productivity than businesses who are opening themselves up to a broader range of people competing in the marketplace. And especially if these people are immigrants or newcomers who may be willing to accept a lower wage to get started out in a job, even if they're more qualified. Right. And a business that's overtly racist or bigoted or exclusionary is eventually going to develop a reputation for this. You know, someone's going to pick up on it at some point. And these days when you've got services out there like Yelp and, you know, just social media in general, it's not hard to spread the word about some business that's really engaging in discriminatory practices. I know some libertarians will get on their high horse about how each business is free to associate or discriminate however they want. And that is true. But really, I think what gets lost is that that statement is limited to when is it okay to go into that business and point a gun at them and force them to hire some guy that he wouldn't have otherwise hired or to take on a customer that they wouldn't have otherwise taken on. And it sounds ridiculous to say that you'd actually go in there with a gun and force somebody to hire someone because obviously it's going to be just a terrible relationship for both of them and it would only last as long as the threat was in effect. Not to mention that, but it would probably give this bigoted business owner more of a feeling of justification that he was right to be bigoted because someone's come in with the guns blazing just to force him to hire someone that he didn't want to hire. And so a lot of people construe this sort of argument to be that all libertarians are racist or something like that, that they actually support this guy and think it's okay what he's doing. But as we discussed in the Foundation series, which is episodes one through three, when we talk about the ideas of anarchism or libertarianism, it's really limited to the scope of when is it okay to go in and point a gun at someone. But there are anarchic ways to deal with this sort of situation. And of course, boycotts and, I guess, negative publicity campaigns. As long as you're not going in there and threatening this guy with violence, then you can pretty much do whatever you think is going to be effective to support businesses who are acting more in line with your own ethics. So there, we just solved racism. So in one of our Foundation Series episode, we made some offhand comment about immigration, that it's a big topic. And as it turns out, we've done two episodes addressing this topic. I feel like we've still almost barely scratched the surface. <laughs> yeah. So episode eight will be the third and final episode of the Citizen of Nowhere series, where we'll speculate as to what a world would look like without borders and consider some possible approaches to achieving such a world. And in the next episode, I'll reveal where my family has ended up after a year of travel. The British Commonwealth, where the English live. British people's living area. The landmass located northwest of France, upon which live the Britons. Not New England, but Old England. Have you seriously not heard of it? I don't know how else to explain it to you. Have you ever seen Downton Abbey? What about... Are you being served? BBC Seven? No. Hugh Jackman's not from there. International men. They won't be contained by walls. Or shrubbery. No borders can contain to boundaries, they say, no. Fighting moral turpitude wherever they find it, and wherever they make it, their passports have more ink than David Beckham, who happens to be from the part of the earth where people speak like this. They are omnipotent. Present, and they once stayed at an Omni Hotel. They pledge allegiance to no one. The allegiance pledges to them. Or does it? Think about it. But not too hard. A little harder than that, though. Is
I can't do it. <laughs> He's nowhere. He's nowhere. He's nowhere. He's nowhere. <laughs> He's nowhere. It's got to be one of those. <laughs> He's nowhere. I hit that four or five times, so that's got to be it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm just scratch something out of that. Say goodbye.